Hello everybody, James here, Storytime with Dutch Mantel, episode 87. Intro, dash, Pro Wrestling Tees. We are on Pro Wrestling Tees, a link will come up probably at the side. And of course, Dutch is going to be selling his own stuff as well with University of Dutch Caps. They are selling like hotcakes signed, if the colour sort of allows them to be signed, I guess. And also there is a figure there of Dutch Mantel that Dutch is thinking about auctioning off at one point, but... Not just yet, because he has to get more copies made of it before he sells the original. In Ask Dutch Anything, we are going to be... So this is a good teaser for next Tuesday. Dutch is going to be tasting Woo Energy, Ric Flair's energy drink for the very first time. First time. So I'm, I'm going to try this, and I'm going to tell everybody if it's worth buying. How much is this can? Six of them was $20 shipped. It's not too bad. Well, you've not tasted it yet. We'll we'll find out if it's good. Oh yeah, and then we'll see I mean, if it's good or not. okay. <laughs> I'll tell everybody when, when are we going to do this. Uh, we're going to do this on Ask Dutch Anything. That's going to be on Tuesday's episode, and that's going to be the highlight, the main event of that show. So I'm glad they finally arrived. They took the and time. Somebody tell Vince, um, Vince. Somebody tell Rick we're going to do it. So you. He'll tune in. He'll have some comments on it. No, oh, I'm sure he'll have some comments on it, I know. But we want to be fair and impartial, as we always are. I, I mentioned Pro Wrestling Tees before, and Dutch has finally got some T-shirts from Pro Wrestling Tees themselves. So here you go. You people mean nothing to me, the classic. And where's the other one? How many have you got? Did I send you two? I got two. Right, there's a, new, are... there's a new one as well. But uh, Sorry, this is a new design. Can you I like see that? that one. Oh yeah, I like that one. Oh yeah, that's a good one. And then there's a well, old... I, I I would have put them on this morning, except uh, they came. They actually came last night. Jeez. So I was already dressed to go on the show, and I was running late. But how much are these shirts? Good question. I think the twenty five. They're either twenty five or twenty seven dollars each, depending on the t shirt. But very reasonably priced, I'm sure you'll agree. Pro wrestling tees. I've got a. Well, hang on. The first thing we don't mention is that one Dutch has diplomas, as we always mention. He will sign it twice. Once as Dutch Mantel, and once as the provost of the university, Zeb Coulter, as well as those two books behind him that you can uh, see now. The world according to Dutch and tales from a dirt road. Go to Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail dot com. And get in touch with the Dutchman, and he will uh, tell you the price, sign, get your address, and he will ship it out for you, the whole kit and caboodle. And there you go, really. I've got a couple of plugs as well. I have books, Owen Hart and The Rock. I, they're long since disappeared in this office. I'm moving house in a couple of weeks, so everything's a bit higgledy-piggledy. But also have Franchise University with Shane Douglas. The episodes come out every single Wednesday and that's been picking up steam as well, I'm very pleased to say. That is on iTunes, that is on Podbean, it's on everything. All the audio podcasts as well as YouTube, Shane Douglas Official. Oh, dearie me. Let, let me announce this while I, uh, I'm thinking about it. Mm -hmm. The first week in May, I'm going to make an appearance at a uh, convention in Evansville, Indiana. So, and I don't make a lot of appearances because I'm all beat up, but uh, you don't they don't have call to. Me. You just make money. You make money sat at <laughs> home now. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, and hey, I like I liked to go to conventions. Somebody said, hey, you get to see your old friends. I said, I couldn't stand half of them when I was working. <laughs> I hated them. I don't like the others either, but I do like to talk to the fans. Because the fans, to me, are, hey, without the fans, I would have had to go out and get like a real job. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'd have to get up like, I don't know, 7 o'clock in the morning to be there at 8 or 8.30. That never appealed to me. Never did. But I appreciate the fans. like talking to them. And uh, and they're much more interesting than my my old buddies, the wrestlers, even though it, it is good to see them, see how they're doing. So uh, I, I don't know the exact date, but it's the first weekend in May. Second weekend in May, May 10th and 11th, Evansville, Indiana. Uh, oh, sorry, this, this fellow's written out. So I think uh, for Ask Dutch Anything, I'm looking at the script. He's written May 10th and 11th, so it might be the second weekend. Okay, we'll have, yeah, we'll it, have more details. No, 
No, it is it is a two day convention, so I'll be there both day. Is that Saturday and Sunday? I hope so. I'd have to okay. check. All right. But I think Second. you are going to be the uh I mean the well, bell of, the bell of the Lawler's. ball. Friday and Saturday, apparently. Oh, I could be Bell of the Ball. Oh, you will yeah. be because you don't make many appearances. You're now an international superstar, uh, entirely thanks to this podcast, not due to your 50 years of wrestling in, in my mind. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this is your first appearance but, in how many months? All, uh, oh, my God, a year or more. Yeah. Probably a year and a half. It's the 10th and the 10th or the 11th. I'm looking at it right now, my daughter. May the 10th and 11th, 2024, Evansville, Indiana, at the National Guard Armory. They were going to have it in the old Evansville Coliseum, but it is undergoing repairs. So, and I would like to see that building because it's an old, it was probably built in the 40s, classic building. And boy, we had a, we had a lot of great matches in it. It was a, it was a Wednesday night town. Every Wednesday night we were in Evansville and it wasn't a bad trip. And, uh, I think it was on, it was on Eastern time. I think I'm was that little anyway, but one of those towns, you know, Nashville's like on central time. I mean, uh, Eastern time. And if then, uh, if Evansville or Louisville was on uh, central time, you got back an hour earlier. Instead of getting back at one o'clock, you got back at twelve o'clock. But it wasn't a bad trip, and I I always enjoyed going there. So tenth and eleventh of May, write it down, and uh, and you can look it up. So get your tickets, and I'll see you there. So funny. One of my friends has just got back from Nashville, and he and he went there for two days, and he said one he had a great time. It was a great place to go, but also you know every bar has not only got you know some musician downstairs you go upstairs we've got a completely different musician upstairs and apparently tipping the uh <laughs> tipping the musicians is mandatory and the minim- minimum tip is 25 dollars so it's really? an expensive night out now apparently in nashville so he said I, i've never heard that before the minimum tip is 25 bucks apparently that's what that's yeah, what he says th- th- those guys are wrapping up mm-hmm. I, I, well i tell you what i would be a single I'd be a single act. I'd play the guitar and sing, so all the twenty-five dollars would go to me. Mm. That's what I'd do. Oh yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't spend it. I wouldn't have a bass player or a rhythm player or a drummer. It would just be me. It's just you so. on a washboard, so you don't even have to spend any money on the <laughs> on an instrument. Oh yeah, me sitting there, boing boing yeah. boing. <laughs> uh, he plays the washboard hey, and the spoons. This is what we really got to brag about. Yes. Last week, and we're going to be talking about it today, too, the Vince McMahon news is everywhere. It's in the New York Times, and it's in the L.A. Times, and all the big papers carried it, and all the networks carried it, and all the all the cable companies carried it. Everybody carried it. But, and of course, we carried it here, too, because that's our... That's our bread and butter just to talk about wrestling. So we did uh, our podcast last week. What number was that? Well, it was, uh, it wasn't two weeks ago. It was about 10 days ago. And um, from Sunday the 28th to now, we've managed to scrounge up uh, another 5,000 subscribers in about 10, 11 days, which is an amazing number for us. So, I like to hear. I like to hear that this podcast is going from strength to strength. You've been getting a lot of emails, uh, sort of congratulations, and and uh, even and we had and we had three hundred and thirty thousand plus views on the podcast. We've never had that many. Never. We've hit a hundred. We've hit a hundred and twenty, a hundred thirty, maybe, but three hundred and thirty thousand views for for us. That's a record, and I, I take great pride in that. And I got a—I bet I got a hundred emails. You know, for me to get a hundred emails is big, because a lot of people they're not going to sit down and write an email. It, that, that takes time. It takes effort. So they had to enjoy it. And I think a lot of people came over for the first time, and saw the podcast, and saw. Uh, 
that we don't use a lot of bad language and we just get, we just tell the story. And of course, that's the way I talk. I, if you made a trip with me, this is the s same way I talk all the way. And if you make a trip, or so, always make a trip with somebody you enjoy talking to. Never, t I, I used to say this, never say take a trip with a deaf mute. <laughs> it's a boring trip. <laughs> <laughs> because all this signing, I just can't, I can't watch the signing because I don't know what they're saying anyway, because I don't do that and, and drive the car too. You weren't driving. Well, no, I wasn't driving, but I didn't, I was watching the road though. Mm. I was a good road watcher <laughs> because I, and I have, I have ridden with guys. You think you're on NASCAR track with them notoriously fast drivers. I'll, t I'll give you three right now. Harley race. Oh, it was like, my God, it was from wah, wah. I always had fast cars and he would just, it was a hundred, 110 with Harley. I tell you who else drove fast. Jerry Lawler. Just crazy driving down the road. I said, he, but he would slow down with me. I said, please, I, I'll pay you to slow down. Because he's doing like 100. For what reason? I mean, we don't have to get back that early. I and mean, we don't have to get to the building that early. And this is the last one that I remember is uh, Buddy Landale. Hmm. I mean, he just f flew down the road for no apparent reason other than he could. So... But if I rode with a guy and he wouldn't listen to me and he still drove fast, I wouldn't ride with him anymore. And that may have been the reason they went fast, probably to say, uh, <laughs> to get me to stop asking them, hey, are you driving tomorrow or what? But, uh, and they got, they got tickets out the yin-yang. This is Lawler getting a ticket. And they give them, the, but first they say, oh, you're Jerry Lawler, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, hey. Can you sign this? Yeah, yeah. He said, well, and he said, can you do me a favor? What is that? Can you sign an autograph for my son? Or It was really for him, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but he didn't want to ask for it. So will you sign an autograph? And Lawler said, yeah. And he'd sign the autograph, and he'd hand it back to the guy. And we'd take off down the road, and he'd look at it like this, and then he'd go, you know what I do with these duds? I said, what? He said, I file them away. And then he went. He just tore it up and threw it out the window. I said, you know, if that cop was still behind you, he'd get you for littering. And he said, I'll just tear that one up too. <laughs> I, be I bet he had probably at one point had maybe 50 unpaid tickets, which he had to pay Probably by the next time he had to renew his license, they would look and see how many tickets he had. He had to pay them. And with the with the, the late payment, there's no telling how much he, he probably spent two grand paying the tickets. Wouldn't it be easier just to pay the ticket? Or slow down. Or, or slow down, right. So, but Lawler, this is what... Lawler had Lawler was Mr. Memphis because he lived there and everybody knew him and he would make all these appearances or if they wanted a guest for their appearance. Well, Lawler, he lived there. So, and then he would go down and he would make an appearance for, I don't know, back in those days, $500, $1,000. So some of his weeks were just outrageous. You know, if Memphis had a good a good house, a good crowd, well, he'd get paid out the yin yang because he was the star. <clears throat> then, if he made a couple more personal appearances that week and sold his pictures and took pictures with people, of course that that cost you money. There's no telling how much money the guy made. So, no wonder he could drive all those new cars. But then he would go to the dealer. And they'd make him a deal. They'd probably, I, he, I heard this, they would give him a car for a year 
just to drive around. So he was making no car payment, driving at 100 miles an hour, and beautiful car. So he was making money. But he did it the right way. <clears throat> and But they didn't want any other wrestlers living in Memphis. Hmm. You know, the wrestlers had to all live in Nashville or around Nashville. I don't know why. But no no wrestlers could live in Memphis. And I don't know why. And then Lawler, he hated Nashville. Just hated it. He, so finally one day he said, I don't give a shit. Excuse my language. I don't give a damn. I'm going to, I'm moving back to Memphis. I'm tired of this. And he moved. And I don't think Jerry Jarrett liked it too much. But he's from there. And he was the star, so. But he did a good job there anyway. But anyway, that's just that's neither here nor there. It's just telling a story that doesn't have a lot of story relevance to time it. with Dutch. That's why we call it story time with Dutch. There's many, many stories. Now, hey, I, I, hey, can we change the name of this podcast? We can. I'm probably not going to. But what would you like to change it to? Oh, you see how he is, people. He's a dictator. No, we, but you established. But, see, but I've had the University of Dutch for a long, long time. But now you have what Shane University? Uh, franchise University with Shane Douglas. Yeah. Okay. So every, everyone's everyone's got a, a, a an educational establishment in podcast form in the wrestling these days. Well, this is, this is educational hmm. because we actually know these people. All right. What's the first thing on the agenda today? Oh, Let's get going. Lord almighty, there's a lot to get through, let me tell you. Um, in uh, upcoming minutes of this podcast, we're going to be talking about, because we actually got a lot of requests to talk about, Ashley Mazzaro and that case that's been getting mm -hmm. renewed scrutiny as of recent. So we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about The Rock and Cody Rhodes. That was the biggest news. Somehow, not Vince McMahon off the top spot. So much more stuff we'll be getting through as well. But we're going to do a quick few mentions first off jim ross has had cancer treatment skin cancer and recently had surgery on his right hip jim ross said all went well thanks for all your love and support so our best wishes to jim and uh this next one uh, more sad news uh oh, well sorry the, uh, the the cancer treatment going well is good news but this is sad news best wishes to jamie dundee as his son austin joseph dundee died at the age of 33 we don't really know many uh, many details on that. And and I, I've never met that boy. To be honest, I didn't even know Jamie had a son in the thirties. I didn't know that. And I never met, I've never met him, <clears throat> but if you look at him and I, it was, it was, I hate to hear news like that. Somebody losing their son or grandson. Cause I've gone through it. And no matter of words or condolences or anything else or prayers can change the way you feel. I and mean, I know Jamie is hard as breaking. And Jamie, to me, since I knew him since he was like 12, when I think of Jamie, I think of him still as like 16, 17. And silly kid running around skinny as hell. And even when I meet, meet Jamie today, and I saw him not too long ago, I love him to death. And he's hilarious. But it does sadden me that <clears throat> his son passed away. I think they, I don't know what happened to him. Does anybody know what happened to him? No, the only information that I know of is off the memorial uh, website where it was announced and off uh, Jamie's Facebook page linking to have, that. Have they had his... They've already had his funeral, haven't they? I'm not even sure about that. I think they're doing a GoFundMe for it at the moment. Okay. So it may, uh, who knows at this point? We, we have very few details. Well, if any of you have, you know, a couple of bucks to spare, help Jamie out because he he needs it. <clears throat> so and what, what, other, what other news we got? We've got Toby Keith, country music star, has also died at the age of 62 after a battle with stomach cancer. So why am I mentioning a country music star on a wrestling podcast? Well, apart from a guest appearance on WWE Raw in 2010, Keith had history with TNA Wrestling. So he appeared on a couple of the original first episodes 
ever in TNA history. Sure as, did. And uh, I think he had turned up in a battle royal and slammed Jarrett or Jeff Jarrett or something like that. As well as, at one point, having interest in buying TNA. But, sure did. But he pulled out because apparently he was only going to be buying like a stake in TNA or Impact Wrestling at the time, and he would not have full control over the company. So uh, did you ever meet Toby Keith and any any other wrestling-related stories about him? Well, <clears throat> he made the TNA appearance before he made the WWE appearance. <clears throat> I think we were, it was like one of the first couple of shows that TNA did for their Impact show, which, by the way, the Impact name was the one I gave them. They wanted to say, hey, what's a good name for the for the show? And write down a bunch of names. So I wrote it down about three names or something. And they liked Impact, so they took it. Guess how much money I got out of that? No, I can guess the zero, isn't it? <laughs> it was less than zero. And it, it wasn't even a thank you. But Jeff liked it, and I, I guess Dixie liked it. So they said, yeah, we'll, we'll call it Impact. But I think it was in Birmingham, and it was a battle royal. And I think Toby came toward the end or whatever. He, he And this is on YouTube where he ends up suplexing, su suplexing Lawler. <clears throat> I mean, sorry, Jarrett. And he sang a song during the show. Good guy. Really good, and a huge, huge wrestling fan because he's from Oklahoma. So he used to go and watch Mid South wrestling, I guess, in Tulsa or Oklahoma City. And they, in the story about Tulsa and Oklahoma City as as venues and as and as dates, they would run them on the same day. It was always on a Sunday, and they were double headers which is bad if you were in booked on a Saturday, uh, Saturday night and somewhere in Louisiana or South Louisiana, that drive to Tulsa, uh, uh, to Oklahoma city, brutal, literally brutal. I don't think the settlers had such a trip <laughs> and, and, and buggy and a uh, horse, horse and buggy. It was like 500 miles, and a lot of it is on was on two-lane highway, and it's probably gotten a lot better now. And I've noticed that in, in Louisiana, what I noticed about it was a lot of the cars at night had one headlight. And I asked about it. I said, why do all these cars have, most of them have just one headlight? And the guy, he made sense. He said, you know with the shape the roads are in and the rocks on the road, they get busted. And, and it made sense. But uh, we would make Oklahoma City at 3 o'clock on a Sunday and hop, <clears throat> and hop right in the car and go to Tulsa for the – and it was an 8 o'clock show. So – and we'd get – we just had time. If you were on late – Later on the card, you barely had time to get something to eat, and you didn't take a shower. You just stayed dressed and hopped in the car and and, and took off to Tulsa. And then when that show was over, about 1030 or whatever time it was, now you start that trek back home, and you're already tired. So one night, I was so tired, I was by myself. I don't know why somebody hopped to ride with somebody else or something. I slammed on my brakes in the middle of the highway because nobody was behind me and nobody was coming. But I saw, I was so delirious from sleep that I saw like a, a big fence in front of me and I slammed the brakes on it and locked it down. And I said, well, buddy, you need to pull over sleep a while. So I woke up a little bit till I found a, a station or something. You didn't have rest areas in those two lane highways. So I pulled in, I stopped like an hour and a half and got up and finished the trip. But it's, it's amazing to me that more wrestlers didn't die back in those days, but, but they have been, they have been a lot of wrestlers killed in automobile wrecks. 
Uh, I remember one, Sam Bass was in it, and I can't remember the other two guys. And, oh, he was another guy who drove notoriously fast. He may have been the fastest one of all of them. And he was coming back from Memphis one night, and he had Pepe Lopez with him and somebody else. But a truck, and this was on I-40 from uh, Memphis to Nashville, and I think it was at the, I forgot, I used to know the mile marker, but there was a truck that was stalled <clears throat> on a bridge. Like he went down a hill and, you know, the little bridge at the bottom, and it, it wasn't a long bridge. It was only like maybe a couple hundred feet long going over a, a little creek, I guess we call them. And he he hit the, uh, I don't know if he hit the truck or he hit the, or he hit the bridge, but he killed all three of them. And all the, and this was on a Monday night. I remember this. I wasn't there. I was in Georgia. But the whole card for Memphis because was behind Sam because he drove so fast. And when they rode by there, I remember the stories. Jerry Jarrett told me, he says, that looked like Sam's car. And they went up and then they turned around and came back and parked in the median just to check it out. And they were right. It was, it was Sam Bass's car. So, and I remember hearing about that. I think I was either in Georgia or Florida, but somebody called me and told me, that's the way we used to get news by telephone. We didn't, we couldn't get news by internet. We didn't have internet, but, but I've always not driven fast because I'd rather get there in good shape. I mean, I would worry more about my car getting damaged and well, I, I don't want to get killed either, but, and it, and it's not to say these guys weren't warned. They knew what, well, what would happen if they, had an accident going that fast, there's, there's no way. So I think four people got killed in that accident, three three wrestlers, and I think another guy got killed. Maybe not. I don't know. It's been a long time. I mean, it's been probably, oh, 50 40 years. years. Maybe, uh, yeah, 50 maybe. But 50 years? What a, wait a minute. Am I talking about 50 years ago? What the hell? What year was it? No, it had to be in the 70s. Yeah, it was 77. 70s, yeah. You so, got a date on it? I'm just looking now, so it's 40. Yep, 76. He died, so that's 48 years ago. Woo, woo. But anyway, condolences to the to Sam's family and all the rest of them too. Right, okay, we're going to get to the main meat of the news, and... I'm, I'm going to open it. No, 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 save it, save it, save it. For what? We're, we're saving to... it for the other episode. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. This is the Ric Flair drink. Stop giving him free plugs, he's never paid us. I mean, I mean, it's sort of it's hard not to give him a free plug in a sense, but uh, anyway, well, that's for cheap. Hey, that is actually a, a pretty good picture, of Rick. Actually, I do like the design of it. I do like the picture. Yeah, it is pretty good and, and nice color. Well, speaking of people who've had accusations level that, then we're going to get into Vince McMahon now. Vince has been. I, oh, I I love. You know, I told you before we went on the air. This is a uh, every broadcast network or station carried the Vince news. He is the, well, first of all, he's the greatest heel I've ever seen. And I think a lot of fans will agree with me. You want to slap him. You want to, I mean, it, and I've seen him do, they were just, but was that Vince playing a character or was that Vince? Mm. But we'll 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 get into that a little bit later. Yeah, there's a few developments or things that have been established over this past week since we last recorded. One, Vince McMahon had drafted the non-disclosure agreements without WWE's knowledge or approval, which I think that's I think that's a no-no. Yeah, I I think if if things are happening with WWE employees or independent contractors, whichever, and 
you're sort of not cluing in the company about what you're doing in that sense, I suspect. Yeah, so but the company no the company was paying it. Yes, that was another thing that the company's yeah. <laughs> yeah. He didn't pay it, he, or he wouldn't have to tell anybody. Mm. So he let WWE pay it and still didn't tell anybody. That's where, even though he owned the company, they had shareholders, they had stockholders, and he didn't let anybody know. That is, uh, what's that called? I'm sure it's illegal. Probably. Fraud. Mis misappropriation, fraud, yeah. Like yes. That. The next thing is that Jerry McDivitt, the famed Jerry McDivitt, we've talked about him on the show before, was involved in drafting the NDAs, apparently, and then suspiciously retired at the end of last year. I mean, I say suspiciously, he's 75, you know, he's, he's done with it anyway, but... It's funny how, you know, he he announced his retirement earlier, but then he said he was going to work up until the end of 2023. So he's just What's that old saying? The rats desert a sinking ship? Yep. See, they knew more than the rest of us knew. And we he wasn't the only one, I think, that saw this coming. Mr. Kevin Dunn saw it coming, too. And all of a sudden, he retires and... Do, 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 got his severance and he took off. But uh, we'll talk about this a little bit. But I think we're going to see a little more of Mr. Dunn. Oh, that's interesting. Well, and, actually, and I think we're going to see a little more of Jerry McDivitt. And I got a hell of a story about him, too. Oh, we've. I won't, um, tell, it, I won't tell. We already told the story. Yeah, the Puerto Rico story with Tiger Alley. Yes. We've, we've told that one. We told it very but recently, great, in fact. But a great story. And I never met him at one time on the phone and. We didn't get along. I mean, it was very hostile. Search for that Tiger Alley Singh. Uh, it'll be a clip on the YouTube channel. Now, <laughs> the federal raid on Vince McMahon's house, it has now been established, apparently, that the federal raid including uh, included grabbing Vince McMahon's phone. So that is how all these text messages in the Janelle Grant lawsuit have been verified. But they don't need to grab the phone, do they? I think, it, I think it certainly aren't. helps. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, aren't the texts saved for eternity on the home server? Well, you know, things can go wrong in life in that kind of thing. I think with the stone cold evidence that, there's, you know, they've got the text off his phone, they can corroborate the times, they can corroborate any other metadata along with those. I think that's a, a slam dunk case that the text absolutely came from Vince's phone. Just for people. Listen, I, people I, was having, I was having a crappy day yesterday. You ever have those days you don't have any energy much? And I was having a crappy day. and But I thought one thing that cheered me up. I'm not Vince McMahon today. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, woo, woo. All right, go ahead. That, that's neither here nor there. I just thought I'd bring that up. Next up, Ari Emanuel and Mark Shapiro, the two uh, biggest swinging schlongs of TKO, ordered pretty much. What did you call them, the, schlongs? The, the swinging schlongs. Apparently, that's what Paul Heyman used to call himself in ECW, the swinging schlong of ECW. I thought I'd throw that in there. Ari Emanuel and Mark Shapiro basically told Vince to quit, to step down. So, uh, by the time the Royal Rumble began, this is a quote, but I'm not actually said where I'm quoting it from, McMahon was gone from TKO seemingly for good as TKO sought to distance itself from McMahon's alleged past transgressions. These concerns culminated the evening of January 26th when Emmanuel and TKO President COO Mark Shapiro called McMahon and told him it would be in the best interest of the company for him to resign. He agreed and submitted his resignation. Now, sources say that TKO executives reached out to all of the company's rights partners after the news broke well aware of the need to keep them in the loop on what was happening so it's funny how the slim slim jim pulling out the royal rumble could have put an end to a hundred years of mcmahon's in wrestling in that sense well i have a theory about all this anyway okay would you care to hear it i do it's kind of it's, it's kind of short i think i mean this is typical normal, I don't know how normal it is, behavior for Vince because it's always followed him. Even when I was there, it was just, it was common knowledge that Vince was like that. And since when I would get around him, I would feel 
these uneasy vibes off of him and the laurinitis too. So it did, this didn't surprise me. But I think when TKO or Endeavor took over the company, the plan was never to have Vince around. I don't think they wanted him around. So when they took over, he was there, and they were getting along with him. They were kissing his butt. they just get through it. And why did he leave the first time? Oh, because of uh, the anonymous email detailing all these non-disclosure agreements and you know, but, the embezzlement. Oh, okay. But they knew that, I think, before they even bought the company because they wrote that he is a liability in their first... Well, everybody, first... everybody knew that because this was in the middle of 2022 and then TKO got involved in the company about April of 23 or something like that. So there was nearly a year between. So Vince McMahon but was they... definitely a liability before they got involved. Well, and they put that down. So when they got him to leave the first time, I, they said, well, okay, fine. We'll, we'll let it... We'll, we'll let sleeping dogs lie. But when when did all the accusations come out? Uh, oh, that we covered uh, two weeks ago, less maybe. But and you know, I, he, know, I know exactly when it was. It was on a Thursday because all the really, really good news comes out on a Thursday just after we've finished recording. Oh, yeah. That's, 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 so, yeah. As that's we normal this behavior for the exactly. show. Yeah. But in, anyway, when Vince left... They were they were all happy. Okay, we can we can go ahead and run it the way we want to now, exactly the way we planned. But he forced his way back in mm -hmm. because he had seventy five or eighty percent of the voting shares, which means that if he didn't like something they wanted to do, they, he could just vote it down. Nothing they could do about it. Now all of a sudden, who owns the company? Vince. They just had bought the company. No, 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 no. So it's not a purchase of the company. It was an amalgamation of UFC, Endeavor, and WWE. So there's no actual purchasing or money changing hands. But, but they had it. They had control of it. Yeah, Vince had eighteen percent of stock. He sold, but still, but still, he had he had the voting shares. Which I, could not, stop them from doing a lot of stuff. Not in TKO, no. I think the voting shares just became regular shares like everybody else's. WWE stock was transferred to TKO stock, so he still couldn't vote anyone out when it became TKO. That 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 would have fallen to Ari Emanuel, Mark Shapiro. And but he then how did he force his way back in then? Oh, this is before the TKO merger. So okay. this was in January around that 2023. And at the time, he did have the voting shares majority with WWE, and that's how he got back in. But when TKO turned up and they merged, then Vince no longer had majority voting power. Well, it still didn't change the story because they had planned for Vince not to be there. Okay. So when he forced his way back in, now they got a problem. And... My belief is the story from the girl, from the lady, Janelle Grant, I think was leaked to the post via somebody, and I'm thinking Nick Kahn maybe, I think it was leaked from inside Titan Towers to the post. Now, that's how it makes mainstream news. And now Vince is... Vince is, he is hung with whatever that, all that publicity, and it's hard for him to fight that. But I never, I don't think uh, uh, that TKO or Endeavor ever intended for Vince to be a part of the company when they took, they took control of it. And they wanted to get rid of him, and they did. I'm glad you mentioned a conspiracy because we're actually going to get, get to a conspiracy later on when it comes to The Rock, and it may involve Nick Khan as well. But for now, we're going to... Oh, really? Uh, I haven't heard that. Oh, it's a good one as well. It's a good one. Uh, I will uh, ask a couple more things about Vince, then we're going to get on to John Laurinaitis, which is the most astonishing maybe news of the week. But <laughs> someone wrote in and said, do you think... No, I, sh I, shouldn't I shouldn't laugh about this, but... Do, do you think 
WWE should cancel the Hall of Fame this year because there's just far too much negative publicity around the company? Or do you think just carry on? No, keep moving. Keep moving. Because Vince is not... I mean, if you cancel the Hall of Fame, that's a... It's a standard event for them every year. Go ahead and and, and do it. Yeah, I wouldn't cancel it. Okay. it. It's business as usual, even though it's not business as usual. And everybody knows you're putting a front on, so you're not fooling anybody. But you would really bring a lot of more attention to it if you canceled it. Next. Uh, Are you we, sure I can't open this? No, no, no. Save it. Save it for later. You don't need the energy. You don't okay. need the mushroom infused, whatever. Um, so Rebecca from San Antonio, Texas actually wrote in as well. I know we don't normally do the questions on this episode, but questions for Dutch at gmail.com, by the way. Dear Dutch, with all that's been happening with Vince and his lawsuit, will this help AEW get over the hump over WWE's popularity? Also, do you think this will prompt the old territories to start up again? I doubt that. But do you think AEW is going to benefit from this in the long run. Because to be honest, I've heard no one talk about AEW at all recently because of this. How can AEW benefit when all the talks about WWE? I mean, and until their product gets better, no, they're going to be in the same boat they're in right now. They're just lagging along. It's like, I don't know. When you watch their show, and this is not a knock on anybody in AEW, but to me, and we're gonna we're gonna see a a little clip a little later on, that even though it's twenty years old, and it involves Vince, it's still a good one. But the AEW stuff is like, it's just boring. The announcers are boring. The, the, I don't know. They they need a lot of work. They need a lot of help. Which, by the way, are we going to talk about Mr. Scott Damore? Oh, that's also going to be on the... Uh, that's towards the end of the podcast, don't worry. Okay, though. go um, ahead. I've, uh, you told me a theory about Scott Damore, about why he was... Uh, another tease for later on the podcast, don't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. About why he may have been... Hey, would you go. call me a conspiracy buff? I think you, you... You've told me you like a conspiracy. I do, because it makes... It makes people think. <laughs> and it... Okay, when you talk about conspiracies now i i'm hearing all this stuff when john kennedy got killed we bought everything they sold us we bought it all one shooter this that jack ruby now we're finding out we they didn't tell us 90 percent of the story they knew it but they didn't tell us through the through the media you want, you want me to book Jesse Ventura, don't you, so you two can talk about Kennedy assassination? Oh, yeah, but but I believe it. I lived through it. A lot of people lived through it, and it could be true. And even if you read it now, you say, wow, yeah. You ever seen Kennedy riding in the car? I've seen it once. I've seen the Sabruda film once. That was enough for me. And he, he gets... Well, the Zabruta, they got another one that shows the bullet entering here. But he went forward. Why would you go forward if a bullet's coming here? Mm. He got he, he got shot twice, and we weren't told that. But anyway, that's our government, ladies and gentlemen. You all work for the government. You, you, That'll be coming soon as well, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'll yeah. be on Tuesday's episode. Now, let's get to the best bit of news. Best, I mean the most astonishing bit. Of course, it happened right after we stopped recording and then we sort of carried on with our lives. John Laurinaitis' lawyer has claimed that it is, in fact, John Laurinaitis who is the victim in this whole thing. Now, (laughs) let me give you the quote. Mr. Laurinaitis denies the allegations in the misguided complaint, Janelle Grant, I believe, and will be vigorously defending these charges in court, not the media. Lawyer Edward Brennan said, like the plaintiff, Mr. Laurinaitis is a victim in this case, not a predator. The truth will come out. And then read the allegations, read the federal statute, power, control, employment, supervisory capacity, dictatorial sexual demands with repercussions if not met. Count how many times in the complaint Vince exerts control over both of them. So, uh, John Laurinaitis, innocent John, we'll call him now. 
uh, is basically, through his lawyer, putting himself on par, victim-wise, as Janelle Grant, which is an astonishing uh, uh, way to tackle these, uh, these allegations. To me, the first time I read that, that's like saying, yeah, we did it. That's convicting Vince. And if he didn't get out, if the jury considers him a victim too, with with her, I mean, he gets off, but he's not a victim in this. I mean, he could have he could have walked out if he wanted to. I mean, he wasn't forced to do this. She, I think she was. I really think that she was. You know, I mean, she was she was the victim, not Laurinaitis. Now, let me ask you this. Who's picking up Laurinaitis' attorney tab? He is? I'd probably say he is, yeah. I th- Janelle Grant's lawyer, and she's a very good lawyer, a former judge as well. I, th- I think she's called Anne Callis off the top of my head. She's got some real pedigree behind her, and also she's probably taking this pro bono, whereas I imagine John Laurinaitis' lawyer is not. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a... Vince and Laurinaitis were like Mutt and Jeff. They were always together, always not necessarily together, but they were considered as one one mind. And yeah, John did agree with Vince, but he's not agreeing because he's a victim. He's agreeing with him because he's an employee and doing the job. Was he a yes man? Oh, yeah, 110%. And Vince, I'm sure Vince would browbeat him like he'd do everybody else. But, you know, you're not going to – you you can't tell me he was a victim when he had to do, do a – he had to know it was an illegal act, any of this stuff. So I think he's convicted Vince, and I think both of them will – will be held liable. I don't think we're going to have a a public trial out of this. I think a, an arrangement, a, a money settlement will be reached that everybody can agree on. But the FBI raiding the office, I think that has a, I think that, that extends a bit farther than the Janelle Grant Lawsuit. Was it the office or was it hit Vince's condo that they raided? No, I think it was Titan Towers. Or was it really? What, wasn't it? Wasn't it? I can find that out. I can find that out in a in a minute or so. I mean, how's how's John Laurinaitis going to spin this? That somehow over the course of I don't know, let's say at least a year, maybe two, that he was somehow coerced into sleeping with Vince McMahon's girlfriend, quote unquote, every week when she would go to his hotel in wherever they were staying breakfast quote unquote again and then you know there are further if allegations they, listen, of, of rape okay let's reenact this John Laurinaitis is waking up in the morning <laughs> then he hears the victim goes to answer the door and who's standing at the door the other victim she comes in they have sex. Wait a minute, they're both victims. Why are they going and having sex if they're both? Why, did, why didn't they just sit there and talk? It would make a damn bit of sense. Yeah, just make, make it up afterwards if John is yeah, clearly and, a victim. And, and, and if Vince asks, how did you have sex? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. How was it? Oh, it was great, great. You know, he never knows unless he has a camera in the room. That doesn't make any sense, but but he doesn't have any any other defense. He rolled over on Vince, and I'm sure his lawyer is telling Vince's lawyer, "Hey, he knows a lot more stuff," and he'll roll over on that too. I think this is not going. I think this is going to get worse and more ugly the longer it goes. Because what makes news? Happy news or really tragic news or bad news? Bad news. 
because that's what all these news stations and publications and newspapers, that's what they run on. So if I get up this morning and I see anything with Vince's name attached to it, I'm going to read it and see what happened now. But, yeah, I, I think that was a, a, a bad defense move by John's lawyer. Yeah, but, but you said that this could be a legal maneuvering to then have essentially two victims against one yeah. on Vince. So now you've got someone corroborating Janelle Grant's version of events. Sort mm-hmm. of, apparently. Uh, uh, basically, not against her, but against Vince now. So he's turned turn coat. He's turned heel on Vince. Does Janelle Grant feel that he's a victim? I suspect probably not. Mm-hmm. And I don't think if it. I don't think a judge will either. And I don't. I don't think it'll go very far in legal circles. One attorney would tell the other attorney, "Oh, don't hand me that crap." That's not flying here. And even even John's lawyer, I don't think he could come up with anything else. And he came up with that, which is a bad, bad defense. So what he's saying is he's act- literally throwing himself at the mercy of the court. And he's pleading, what's that, what's that oath? No low contendere means no contest. Yep. And he's just saying, I'm just a law, I was just a bystander, really, and just working. So that's what I think. Just just to add to something that other people have said, well, if it's so bad and, you know, da, 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 everything that's happened in this lawsuit, why is it a civil case and not criminal? I don't think people realize that in a criminal case, let's say a, a jury of 12 of your peers, you need to have all of them. Exactly, all of, all of them. them. Or maybe you can have a split vote of maybe 11 to 1, maybe. Sometimes, depending on if the judge allows it. But in a civil case, mm -hmm. the majority. The burden of proof is uh, essentially 100% if you believe the plaintiff is 51% in the right, then they get everything. It's essentially Mm -hmm. whoever's more in the right. 50-50, 49-51. It can Mm -hmm. be be that close and still the civil case suit you know it'll be awarded or not awarded uh, on uh, those slimmest of margins so you're far more likely to get a conviction and the other thing is with sexual assault and rape convictions is the, the conviction rate's so low we're talking like a percent or two percent or something like that it's very hard to prove that's why going civil but, uh, okay a, a, a civil suit mm-hmm. i think which it won't get that far do they pick a jury like they do for a criminal case? Uh, yeah, civil suits. I think. What if it's all women? No, I think you have to generally for a jury pick along the breadth of gender and racial lines and stuff like that for the most part. You can't just have like... No, I don't think so. I think more it's, these it, days you can have it representative. Haven't you? No, it's who they agree on. You know, the the... The prosecution, they want all women. Mm. Because women are more likely to agree because Janelle Grant of being a victim and people, women can associate that with with their womanhood. But I think the defense would want guys. But I think even guys, I think it's just, it's it's going to be 80%, 90% a conviction rate if it gets that far. I think it still will. I know you don't think it will go criminal, but I think it will. Just to give an example. But wait a minute. No, it can go criminal from yeah, the civil. Absolutely, it can. Uh, the two different processes. So they, Okay, so, who? Yeah. I, want, I want to compare this to the Harvey Weinstein case mm-hmm. in Hollywood, what, four years ago, whatever? Mm-hmm. Very similar. And, and where's Harvey Weinstein today? Him and He's his gnarled penis. As uh, so many women <laughs> described his little winky as sort of deformed and everything. I like to just get that out there because he's a turd. Uh, he, in prison for a very, very long time, yeah. Right oh, so. yeah. And I think, and this is, to me, the saddest part of this, because Vince, even though he's a weird duck, he has done some good in the world. And, and uh and let me go back to where Cactus Jack was talking about him. 
he talked about him in such a way that almost he, he was, it sounded like he was feeling sorry for Vince because he did make he did make Mick a lot of money, but by the same token, Mick made him a lot of money. So, and he had he had faith in Mick, and they were friends. And I'm sure he hates that Vince finds himself self in this predicament, and I do too, really. But he brought it all on himself. So, but he he was doing this interview like he was almost feeling sorry that this all happened to Vince. Yeah, and keep in mind that Mick, for years, volunteered at Rain, which is like f- for sexual assault yeah. cases that people call up in confidence and get advice on. So, like, he's really sort of <laughs> relating to Vince more than maybe he ought to for someone in position of someone who's volunteered this much for charity work. However, Mick Foley's take. So. Kevin Nash, of all the people uh, who have podcasts in the wrestling world who have some sort of notoriety, probably have the worst take of the whole Vince McMahon thing. You watched the video. Did you work out what he was even saying in it? Well, I listened to it, and it's long. It's lengthy. But when he got to the end of it, I'm thinking, what did he say? I didn't understand his point. If he had a point, you heard it. What what did you get out of it? I actually transcribed it. Well, actually, I put it through a program that transcribed it for me. And Oh, you can't transcribe it for yourself. You gotta use you gotta use AI. Yeah, all the all the repeated words and ums are anyway, I've left them all in. (laughs) So here it is. uh, word for word. You know, one man's kink. One man's perversion is, is, is another man's, you know, just horrific. Uh, then the co-host interjects, one man's three black dongs. And then, yeah, we're all four. I mean, it's just everybody's too, you know, like I, my, my thing I said at the beginning is, if it's, if it's trafficking, if it's rape, if it's sexual assault, those are criminal charges. And those have to be addressed in exactly that manner. If they're just fucking being used to push more money into the situation for somebody to get a payday settlement, then that, that, then, that's wrong. And the systems being used for the wrong, for the wrong, is being used the wrong way. And I don't think that those, that, that people should be, I don't think people should be in any way rewarded for deviancy either way. Right, okay. Uh, that's really the big thing here. I don't think people so should he, be rewarded so he, for deviancy took, either he, way. So is he saying that, hang on, that Janelle Grant's being rewarded for deviancy here? To me, he kind of took Vince's side. And one man's perversion is another man's what? What did he say at the beginning? One man's kink, one man's perversion is 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 another man's you know just horrific. That's legitimately what he said. <laughs> One man's perversion is another man, you know, kink or whatever. I know. Uh, okay. I think if everybody thinks about it, if you put somebody you know in her spot, your sister, your friend, your cousin, even your mom, it, you're, you're going to look at it totally different. But since we don't know Janelle Grant, and this, 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 this didn't just go on for like two weeks or three weeks. This went on for a couple of years. And if, and Vince decided, even Vince decided that it was kinky, and offered to pay her off if she would sign an NDA. Well, she signed it, and he was supposed to give her $3 million. So to make good on it, he did give her a million dollars, but all of a sudden, out of the blue, nope. I mean, the thing with Endeavor started and all this, well, I'm not going to pay you any more money. Didn't even hear from him. So... You know, if you agree, it's like, uh, okay, I'm going to buy this car from you and I'm going to give you, said car is three grand. 
I'm going to give you a grand. I'll, I'll pay you other, in, you know, in increments. Okay. But all of a sudden, you get to three, the $1,000, he drives off in the car. But the other $2,000 doesn't appear. Well, she wanted it. Agreed and I don't it. think, well, he agreed to it. That's what I'm saying. Vince, if he didn't want it if, like that, and the NWA, have, have we found out it's illegal? You're saying NWA, like I was I mean, last week now, NDA. <laughs> NDA, that, no, we, I don't no, mean NWA. No, 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 we haven't found out. that. That's going to be part of the court process anyway, if that, it gets to trial, of course. I, Let me give you a couple more of uh, the quotes from Kevin Nash in the same lengthy um, rambling clip. Now, where, where is this interview? Online. Uh, I think it's his podcast. Uh, elsewhere, Nash said on Triple H's Royal Rumble presser performance, my friend got harassed, Triple H, because he didn't, in the middle of Royal Rumble weekend, along with the fact that two of the stars of their top ten are now out, that he didn't take the time to read the 63 pages that his father-in-law had already backed out of the company and said, I'm done. Which is missing the point. Didn't have to read all 67 pages, it was because he will have more than a good idea of what they were about. And also because Paul is such a good friend. I love Stephanie to death. Shane's a friend. Linda's always been good to me, so it's a family I've always felt welcomed around. Vince was the first person to see anything in me as far as the ability to be a star. He put me as that figurehead of this business during the steroid trials, which he didn't. It was 94 when Brett was the figurehead, not Diesel. Uh, that was 95. So there's, I don't want it to be true, and I don't want to harm... I don't want hard to come to any of those people. So essentially, I mean, really is sticking up for the McMahons in general here. Well, that's because he knows them. And I, you know, I don't hold that against him. Well, no, but... it, it's a, it's, it's a bad situation, but who was it brought on by? By Vince. Mm -hmm. Linda didn't do it. Shane didn't do it. Stephanie didn't do it. Vince did it. So you need to feel sorry for them for Vince's to me. Stupidity. But Vince gave now, you Vince, opportunities. Vince gave you opportunities over yes, the I course did. of and, two and, different things, but you, you're not afraid to just say, well, apparently the dude, and it's likely that these things are true enough, you know, but other like like Mick Foley and, and Kevin Nash are coming out almost to the defense of Vince, so at the very least just saying, I hope it's not true. Yeah, Where, well. But, I mean, why are they saying that and you're not? I, I am not saying they're defending him, but they are trying to, let's use the word minimize, minimize his involvement with the thought that, you know, I hope this is not true, but they know it is. They know Vince and, and they have a lot of respect for the family and a lot of respect for Vince. And they don't want to go on a podcast and act as though, well, since he's having bad time, we'll just, We'll just bury him further. I don't think you could bury him any further anyway, but that is if this gets back to Vince, you know, I mean, and they're wishing it's not true. I do too. I don't want to know that a guy, even though I felt odd vibrations off him when I talked to him, but hey, you could know a, you could know a mass killer. We go out and do it. Well, I hope it's not true either. But yeah, but he loved his dog. He liked fishing. Oh, he did. So, but anyway, I think I think they're doing it because it's on a, a podcast. It's on uh, it's on the the web. So they're just trying not to bite the hand that feeds, in a sense. I think maybe. And I don't know. Well, I do know, but I think the people they they know what I'm trying to say. Okay, we're going to move on because I mentioned Mick Foley before. He had his very final podcast. It's one of those things where I didn't really, he barely did any anyway. He just, he did like once a month. Anyway, his final podcast that was out recently and the big news, aside from the fact that he didn't really say anything about Vince McMahon, was that he wanted to have one more match at the age of 60. So the quote is, 60's right around the corner, Foley said. Thinking of doing one final match for my 60th birthday. Deathmatch, I'm not kidding. I think it would be a great incentive to drop those 100 big ones. 100 big ones mean he wants to lose 100 pounds. And I think it might be fun. No, not in WWE, I don't think so, because I think it would be a pretty gory spectacle just thinking about it. 
And then afterwards, when asked about who the opponents might be, John Moxley or Matt Cardona Foley replied, I think Moxley would be the easiest, but Matt Cardona has the heat in the deathmatch world that could really make it something cool. You know about these veterans, they, they, can't, they can't quit. They just cannot quit. Why is it that singers can quit? <clears throat> I mean, they can just walk away, made their money, go home and relax. But wrestlers, but there is an old saying about wrestling. You don't quit wrestling. Wrestling quits you. And that's basically what happens. So, and Vince, uh, I mean, uh, Mick would probably have a pretty good pay-per-view. He would do the same thing on it that, that Flair did. But it won't be a shining moment. And if he drops a hundred big ones, what I think, I, what I thought he was saying at first was, well, it's going to cost you a hundred bucks <laughs> to, to watch that. Drop a hundred big ones on it. But he was saying, let me drop a hundred big ones. Well, that would take a year so he could train. But what kind of match would it be? He wants, but if you he see wants a his, death match. He wants a hardcore match. Basically, I think something that isn't athletically taxing but hurts a lot. Wait a minute. None of his matches were ever that athletically taxing, except when he got thrown off the cage. Do you know, I think that's a bit unfair on Mick because I think he was, he he really, you know, put the effort in a lot until about 98. Oh, I'm maybe, not saying that. Say. I'm not saying he didn't work yeah. hard. He did. But he's, you know, you, you wouldn't look at him and say, oh, he's not a Shawn Michaels. No. He's not this. He's not that athletically he's limited and he'll tell you that but he could go out and he could he could bleed with the best of them and use the use the fluorescent lighting and he could use the the barbed wire and he could use the baseball bat and he could use this and that and the other i don't know i think somebody got in the back of a car one day and pulled out all these gimmicks like a hammer and a barbed wire and Wow, that'd be great to have in a match. I'm sure that's where it started. Let's put this, let's put barbed wire around that. And hey, wait a minute, let's put bombs on it too. So if you touch it, it blows up. I think I don't know whose idea that was, but I think it was imported to Japan first. And I think it was brought into the country by guys, and I may be wrong, by guys like Mick who liked that shit because it gave their performance somewhere to go. So to me, I'm not like that. I'm a wussy. You know, they want to put me on scalpels and stuff. And uh, it was at, at one point I just said, I'm not doing it no more. I'm not doing it. And I even turned some matches down that were like no DQ. I said, I'm not doing it. One guy booked me one time, and I went there, and he was in an OD DQ match, hardcore match. I said, I'm not doing it. Why, well, man, it's already booked. I said, I don't give a crap how you booked it. I told you I wasn't doing it. Well, what are we going to do? I said, well, the only thing I can say is I'll hardcore on you, and you just <laughs> don't touch me. Well, man, would that, would that work? I said, yeah, well, it work the way I do it. And it did work. I just, I just beat him up. So... And then I, I gave him the finish, and we went home. But I don't know. I, I think he would have a pretty good a pretty good uh, pay-per-view uh, buy rate on it. Because if it's his last match, you know, they, people want to see that. But I actually, let me, let me say this. I actually think Mick would take more in his performance or expect more out of himself than what Flair did. Hmm. I think his performance, even though he'd be, he's been out of the ring for 20 years, I think his performance would be better than what Flair's was. At least if he, if he is still standing when the match ends, that, that's a victory for Mick because we thought, we thought Rick was going to die. But Mick Foley, uh, I, I think he, he'd give us a better performance than what Ric Flair did. Do you know? Oh, and speaking of Ric Flair, wait a minute. Here we go. That's for 
I'm ask gonna try Dutch. it. I'm gonna, no. tr- I'm gonna try it. No. Yeah, I'm gonna try it. No. When? Uh, ask Dutch anything on uh, Tuesday. Yeah. That's gonna. That's gonna be it. That's gonna be it. Don't you? We're really building this up. I must say, we're building it up. Ask Dutch anything. It'll be a good. Uh, <laughs> let me let me just stick with Mick for a minute. One, why would you need any more motivation to lose a hundred pounds other than that you've got four kids and you're a walking heart attack? I mean, surely that would be enough motivation to, you know, lose a huge oh, amount of weight because you're morbidly obese. Okay, go to the mall or go to somewhere where there's people. You, you see those guys or women all the time. And if they should be motivated to lose weight too, mm. but so you can't you can't blame that on 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 Mick. I can so, blame it on everyone really. Uh, the other thing is. I mean, he couldn't take his own socks off 15 years ago. So what kind of shape is he going to be in 15 now, how years do, how do you How do you know he couldn't take his socks because off? Because he was on an episode of Wife Swap, and that was actually revealed on the episode of Wife Swap. He that, couldn't take his socks off. No, he couldn't actually get down to take his socks off. That's like how basically beat up and crippled he was back then. And I can't imagine well, he's got better. I, he had a brief period when he was doing DD. DDP yoga, free plug for you, Dallas. And he dropped a load of weight. He got back briefly into like a, a GM position on WWE TV. He looked the best he'd looked since 2004. And then yeah. for whatever reason, he just didn't do it anymore. And then he just put all the weight back on and um, he just fell so, out of love with working out, I guess. And and you heard, you heard that this is his last podcast? His last, last podcast is done and out now is done. done. Yeah. Well. Well, I'm gonna. I would be interested in seeing his last match. Mm. I would. I would even pay to see his last match, but under a wrestler discount. <laughs> like if he wants to charge seventy five dollars to see it, I said, yeah, I might go for ten. So let me in on the big. 80% off discount and here I want a, I want a, a good seat so I want to see it but well, I think it'd be pretty interesting really now that I think about it yeah I think it'd be interesting it'd be more interesting than Rick's because Rick's was more like will he die on live on pay-per-view <laughs> well that's that's fatalistic <laughs> you see, thought that come off but but in in Mick's uh, case he has all kind of gimmicks he can use you know, like I said, the the fluorescence and the and the tacks on the floor and the tables and the barbed wire and this, that, and the other and the fire and and the blood and the guts. So he's not going ninety miles an hour. Rick had to actually get. I'm gonna give him credit. Rick had to get in there. He had nothing to depend on except himself, and he proved that he himself is not enough. Because people, if they're saying, are, is he going to die? Yeah, that's not a good thing to lead the match with. Anyway, all right, let's keep continue. So something that we were asked to talk about quite a few times. I got emails, I got comments over the last 10 days. How's that mustache, how's that mustache today? Well, you always said that the best compliment was that it was looking quite symmetrical. Yeah, it looks pretty yeah. good today. Yeah, huh? I think it looks pretty good today. Nice and symmetrical. We are going to talk about a... Uh, uh, the, the mustacheless gender, again, the ladies. And oh God, I've got a cramp. In some chest wait a minute. Some of them. Some of them. Yes. Did I ever tell you a story that um, I'll tell it on the podcast? I'll leave it in. It's sorry while I'm massaging my meaty chest because uh, I've got a cramp in it somehow. <laughs> my brother used to do. Um, he used to used to own a, a laundry many years ago. And he was doing deliveries to old folks around the thing. And he said there was a woman that always really had a great big mustache, like bristles the whole bit. And one day she answered the door in just like a nightgown. And then my brother was talking to her politely and she was talking to her and, you know, she needed she needed caring for, you know. And then in the middle of this conversation, just a turd just falls out and just hits the floor. You know, I could have listened to you all day, James. But I think a turd falling out just out of yeah. the clear blue, yeah. you could have left that out. It was the clear brown. And <laughs> do you, oh, my and, God. And do you know what she said afterwards? She went, oh, it happens at my age. 
Oh, my that. God. You know, like the people last week, we talked about Vince doing that little ditty that he did to that Janelle Grant. Mm. A lot of people said, oh, I wish I'd never heard that. What you just told me there, <laughs> <laughs> you could have talked all day and not told me that. But but it is kind of. You enjoyed it. I did. I liked it. Oh, me, me, and my brother. Have I, got I'm like just, I'm just apologizing to. The, see, I try. I, I, I tell all the fans that write me at Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail dot com. I tell them that I we try to hold the bad language down, but I don't know if that's bad language. But it is. What would you call that? A a turd dropping out out of the blue. What would you call that? Just off color. Interesting. Off color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting story, okay. I think. Okay, we're gonna, well, we've had the fun of frivolities. You'll only, you'll only hear it here. Okay. Oh, I've got other podcasts I could tell that story on as well, but I probably won't now. There you go. Uh, that's, that's next the, question. That's the third story for this week. Right. Um, so, a bit of fun there. We're going to get onto a not fun story because, as I say, we got a lot of messages, a lot of comments from people saying, hey, would you address Ashley Mazzaro, the Ashley Mazzaro story? So... She was... And that hasn't been that long ago, right? She died 2019. So, no, it's mm -hmm. a, it a few years ago. But accusations... Uh, there are actually two real sets of accusations that Ashley Mazzaro levels against WWE and things that happened within WWE. So I'm going to give you the first one first. So there's been renewed interest in the passing of Ashley Mazzaro in recent weeks after the Vince McMahon allegations came to light. So... Back in 2017, Ashley signed a sworn 17-page affidavit testifying to being seriously sexually assaulted during a tour of military bases in 2007, as well as WWE and Vince McMahon personally putting her at severe risk of physical harm against her wishes. Now, I'm going to be talking about the... Uh, we'll talk about the assaults after we talk about this first. The consequences of which she would suffer for the rest of her life. Uh, we have to boil down the accusations for the sake of time constraints, but let's get to the physical injuries first and then unnecessary risk out of the way first. So, uh, And also, thank you to ProWrestlingStories.com for the write-up. Aside from my ongoing physical injuries, this is Ashley talking, that were sustained in the ring, and my former battle with addiction to this day, I suffer from depression, for which I take medication, migraine headaches, and severe short-term memory loss. I attribute these issues to my work-related injuries sustained while working for the WWE, and specifically this, to this the... This is Ashley talking. This is Ashley talking in the, um, in, the... Uh, in, the, in the affidavit. Uh, repetitive blows to the head I received in the ring over the course of my career, which were not properly diagnosed or treated. I've had multiple documented concussions during my career. Aside from the times I was knocked unconscious and out cold for five minutes, I also have a fractured spine, a five-inch metal plate inserted into my ankle, and debilitating back injuries. Vince McMahon himself ordered a cast to be sawed off my right hand slash wrist moments before I was thrown back out into the ring to wrestle on TV even though my cast was not scheduled to come off for another two to three weeks. I was beat down, broken, and being almost forced to perform. Now, I've got to add a tiny bit more to it and then I'll throw it to you. After climbing... Uh, Wait a minute. Yes. A cast was sawed off of her broken arm? Yes. So she could go to the ring? Yes. And, okay. That's not unusual. I've heard that from no, Jake that's, and Snake that, Roberts back in the day. That's, that's, that sounds normal. That's a normal day for WWE with Vince. But uh, I believe that uh, Jake the Snake Roberts once, once told the story that he was told he had basically broke his wrist or something like that, that he either cut the cast off immediately after breaking it or you'll never work in this territory again, wherever he was, whoever told him this. So he duly cut the cast off, shattered his arm, and then he was out for like six to eight months. Did they pay him? Of course they didn't. Territory See, days, if the, he didn't work. That's, he didn't. that's the lawsuit there. But if he'd, if he'd taken the lawsuit, he, he would uh, damn sure never work there again. See, Vince is the type that holds a grudge forever. This isn't, with Jake, this isn't WWF. This is pre-WWF, I should say, in his case. Well, who made him cut his deal off? I don't know. I don't know if it was a Bill Watts thing or wherever, but it was it was early in his career. Oh, okay. But as I say, was this usual in wrestling back in the day? You, you... No, not really. Unless it's a super, super 
I mean, you got a hell of a house or whatever. I don't know. But, and it kind of sounds a little bit like nobody else I know would make somebody cut the cut a cast off. Now, since WWE did it, nothing was ever said about it then. So, I mean, that's past the point of trying to sue over it. But wrestling is, listen, there's no other business like wrestling, really. These things happen and you think about it and you go, what the hell? Because, see, that's what, <clears throat> when I work an independent show, I go in, not now, but I used to go in, and I was always so friendly, so nice, because I didn't know maybe one of these guys could have just killed their family. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I say something out of the way to him, and he just kills me too. I don't know these guys. It's like you walking into a different tribe and not knowing what's going on. So that old saying about stay in your lane, mm -hmm. that's one of the way I, ways I learned that. Because don't get involved in something that doesn't, doesn't concern you. But the, but, but the story about sewing off a, a cast, I've never heard that before. And that was that was before Mid South. I don't know where this happened to Jake, but this let's say that was in the late seventies. You know, territory stuff. You've got to tough it out and get back in. Whereas this is two thousand and five or six or what or seven or whenever this is. This is the mid two thousands where this is happening. With Ashley, with, with Ashley, with Ashley, it's crazy. Uh, let me give you a bit more because uh, not just that injury, but more. After winning the 2005 Raw Diva search on August 15, 2005, Mazzaro claimed that WWE offered her a one-year contract to become the face of the women's division, but in a spokesmodel capacity, not as a wrestler. Inconsistent with her status as a non-wrestling spokesmodel, WWE required Mazzaro to perform four to five days a week as a wrestler, only one week after winning the competition and without any training under her belt. Ashley requested Stephanie McMahon send her to OVW for training, but she flatly denied her, saying she'd lose her fan base and momentum. After receiving multiple concussions and back injuries in short order, because obviously she wasn't trained and she didn't know how to bump, Trish Stratus advised her to shake it off because people who spoke up about injuries no, were usually Trish, punished. It, it, oh, Trish Stratus told her. Yes. To shake it off. Yes. So, I mean, it's incredible that one, they basically, according to this anyway, WWE fed her a bunch of bull as far as what her duties would be when she won the competition. And then they didn't even let her train. That, that sounds par for the course. I believe that. Because WWE, while, while they profess a great love of wrestling, they don't know the skill that it takes. A girl coming off the street cannot go in the ring and start taking suplexes. She can't start taking slams or arm drags because her body is not used to it. It's like anything else. If you want to lose weight, it takes you time. If you want to toughen your body to take these moves, you got to work up to it. Because if you don't, now you have a fear of taking it. And the fear sometimes hurts as bad as, as, the, as the bump. Now, if you was an experienced guy and somebody wants to slam you, you said, nope, not doing it, not doing it. If you were hurt going into the ring, and I've worked a lot of matches hurt, but I tell the guy, what's this arm? What's this shoulder? What's this knee? And don't even, don't even think about it. And they would take care of me. So your wrestler's motto, do no harm, same as a doctor. You go in there and you work with what you have. And that's how you learn to work. That's how I learned to work. I'd go in the ring and the guy say, watch, watch my back, watch my back. Okay, okay. Now I'm thinking about things to do that doesn't concern his back, which teaches me to, to go a different way. And that's how I learned to work. It makes sense, I think. And a lot of those guys, when they tell you, those old timers, when they tell you, don't do this, they meant it. 
because I was going to build this guy out of the corner one time and hooked it wrong. Next thing I know, he spun, he slapped me. He slapped the taste out of my mouth. And then we finished the match because he was a lot older than me, but hell, tougher too. We got in the back and he said, hey, kid, let me tell you, don't ever try that again. And I, he said, that's what the cuff, he didn't call it a slap. He called it a cuff. He said, that's what the cuff was for. But I learned right then how to do that move. I learned the hard way, but at least I learned it. So I don't know if guys today, they get that type of training because I think a lot of you, how you, they don't even want you to hit nobody now. But anyway, uh, the Ashley Mazzaro case, when did she, when did she pass away? 2019. And she, she, she wasn't working for WWE then, right? No, she only had, you know, a few years with WWE. And she was, was she manic depressive? No, uh, no, no. She was suffering from uh, depression issues for a number of years. Uh, She quotes at the end, I believe WWE has caused major problems, life-altering problems, and wish more than anything that I never work for them. So, uh, just before we get to the other accusation, uh, to throw my two cents in for whatever it's worth, I've never wrestled, but I did a lot of judo when I was a teenager, and the first thing they do tell you is how to take a fall how to break your fall. It's more important. It's paramount more than anything else. They won't let you do anything even remotely strong or, you know, or competitive unless you, unless they're confident in you. You can break your fall when you hit the mat. So for WWE, I mean, this is at the time when they're starting, you know, the concussion news, you know, how devastating concussions are as well. It's just mm-hmm. starting to filter in more and more. So I can't believe they'd leave themselves open for no good reason. No one was tuning in to see her, really. You know, she wasn't like a major star. So why I can't believe they put her in such a horrible position. Well, it's WWE. They, I think they were learning, too. I think WWE has never been in the, in the business of training wrestlers. They would usually leave that up to independent wrestling schools, independent promotions, but as far as them training somebody on the job, they have done it, I guess, but they had to be, I don't know, it's, it's very, very tough. And if you take a, I'm going to give you a prime example of training somebody on the job, and it's Bill Goldberg. What did he do in the ring? Nothing. He just did a couple of things, boom and hit you with the spear or whatever he had, it was it was over. But after they saw that for a, a whole year, well, hell yeah, he was over. But he wasn't over because of his interviews. He wasn't over because of his impeccable wrestling ability. He was over because the promotion put him over. And everybody in the promotion, they lost to him. So when it come time for him to have a longer match than three minutes, he suffered, and the match suffered, and his opponent suffered. So that's the that's the drawback of having somebody uh, that that doesn't know what they're doing. He had he didn't know where to go after his little routine was over. He was lost. Let's get to the other accusation. Now, Ashley Mazzaro. Oh, yeah. I, I like I like accusations, but go ahead. While <laughs> WWE was visiting military bases in the Middle East on a two-week tour, Ashley started suffering from menstrual cramps and wanted to rest in an air-conditioned Humvee. Some of the soldiers suggested that this could be due to dehydration, because it's a hot country, happens often, and she was taken to sickbay and given an IV for what, quote, felt like hours. After, <clears throat> excuse me, Jimmy Hart came to check up on her, and say WWE personnel were off to grab some food. A man in an orange t-shirt and cargo shorts accompanied by a woman in full military fatigues identified him himself as a doctor. Mazzaro was sceptical as all other doctors on base were wearing scrubs. The man then administered an IV of unknown substance in her arm. The following is a quote from the affidavit. 
Almost immediately after the alleged doctor and the woman in fatigues moved me into a room that did not appear to be a treatment room and placed me on a table. The woman guarded the door while the man proceeded to inject me with a drug that caused me to be unable to move my body or to scream. The man then proceeded to violently rape and sodomize me. I was completely helpless to defend myself against this attack as the drug he injected rendered me temporarily paralysed. Despite being unable to control my movements, I remained fully conscious for every second of the attack. I felt excruciating pain as a result of this man penetrating me by force and against my will in a violent and aggressive manner, while I was completely defenceless. Each se excuse me, each second that went by was excruciating, and I have never felt more helpless or been more terrified in my entire life. The experience was a living nightmare. I've got more to follow up with with reaction to WWE, but I mean that's as serious a complaint that you can level against someone without murder essentially like that. That sounds absolutely terrible. Well when when I'm first hearing it, I'm thinking what well, there was another woman there. She guarded the door. So now I'm trying to think they took her in there to rape her. It just sounds a little off. I'm not saying it didn't happen. But to say it did happen, but she never filed a report on it, did she? Or was she stopped from doing that? Uh, well, we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, very briefly, this is one thing that I didn't add in, is that she also said that she overheard before this guy came in that it was his birthday. Apparently other people were talking outside and saying it's his birthday. So the theory is it was somehow some sort of birthday treat for him to uh, attack Ashley. And as, as you say, you know, it's, it's an extreme, it's an extreme I mean, story. Was he ever identified? Never identified. At least publicly. Now, Ashley herself didn't want to uh, the information of this incident to become public. So once back in the United States, Vince McMahon led a meeting with her, including other WWE executives. McMahon said that it wasn't in WWE's best interest to make the details of her attack public and should be kept confidential. Vince did... Okay, who did uh, what, I don't mean to stop you. Yeah. That's what I say it right when I stop you. But did they know about this before they left Iraq? Or that I is don't that, know. Uh, it, it was Kuwait apparently specifically, but uh, I don't know if Ashley told them at the time or if she told them back in the states. Uh, Vince did apologize to Ashley for what had happened, but told her to not let one bad experience ruin the excellent work the military was doing. He didn't want to tarnish WWE's relationship with them. Hmm. I don't know about that. No, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm not doubting what that's what Vince said, but it didn't happen to Vince and it didn't happen to his family. So, it happened to, oh, it happened to her. Well, let's just get through this as easy as we can. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was, instead of her, he was thinking about business. So if they have this claim, now they have a hard on for WWE and they may not book him again. He was making a lot of money out of that. But I uh, continue with your story. So to ensure that this wouldn't happen again, WWE instituted a new policy where a female escort would accompany and sorry, a female escort would accompany any female performer who went to the Middle East 24/7. Now there's a couple more interesting things here. After the affidavit was released, WWE denied Ashley had ever made such a claim to anybody in WWE. At no time, this is the quote, was Vince McMahon or the management of WWE ever informed by Ashley Mazzaro or anybody else that she had been sexually assaulted, drugged, raped, sodomized by a military doctor with a nurse standing guard while a goodwill uh, while on a goodwill tour in 2007 to US military bases in Kuwait. In fact, she ever this is written badly. In fact, if she ever articulated such a claim to WWE, we would have reported it immediately to the base commander. At no time was there ever a meeting with Vince McMahon, Kevin Dunn, John Laurinaitis, or other company executives in which he told them of such a claim and was instructed to keep quiet. Now, Dave Meltzer, uh, in fact, on Wrestling Observer Radio today, said, uh, Thursday, because we're recording it on Thursday, said that he believed there was an investigation by the Navy into the incident that went absolutely nowhere. Now, I'm sorry I'm talking a lot here, but John Laurinaitis's 
lawyer responded a couple of days ago. Any allegations that Mr. Laurinaitis has helped to cover up an alleged rape allegation is an outright lie, Edward Brennan wrote <laughs> to Vice. Johnny, and keep in mind, this is all in the same two sentences, Johnny, like most upper-level management, or at some time became aware of the allegations and ensured all proper WW protocols were followed, including privacy for the alleged victim. We object to the use of the term cover-up as no such plan or plot ever took place to hide or assist the alleged rape. They just released something in 2017 where they said it didn't happen, and she never complained, and now the lawyer's saying it did. He's using cover-up. He's, he's convicting them as he's talking. I don't, I'm, I'm going to tell John Laurinaitis, if you're hearing this, you need to look for a different lawyer. This lawyer, he's going to get you cooked before you get there. Shut up. He's using the words, the, the cover-up. Of course it's a cover-up, and he didn't know about it. Everybody knew about it. Except me, I didn't know. I didn't know about it. No, but I did know some shenanigans was going on. I didn't know any details, nor did I want to know any details. Because the more you know, you know, it's not, it's not good for you to know all that stuff. So I didn't, I tried to stay away from it. Now, now this guy, this lawyer, says upper management, including Johnny Ace, were informed of the incident and followed WWE protocols. The WWE protocols of being what? Not saying anything. Apparently that's all the protocol Ooh. was. It's... How he contradicts himself within the same small paragraph is almost impressive. In this yeah, it is impressive. So, But, hey, what are we talking about here? The WWF world. Mm. And it's, it's bizarre. It really is. The story doesn't end there. So there's two more things I've got to mention. Uh, Laurinaitis' confirmation of management's knowledge corroborates the account of Fernando Rios, the former WWE doctor to whom Mazzaro reported the rape, excuse me, burping, who said that he reported the incident to management. So now we have a doctor who's confirmed that Ashley reported it. The doctor said that he reported it to management. So lots of people in management knew. But the, Francisco uh, Rio. Yes, or Rios, or Rios. Rios. Well... I don't know how you could go and investigate that unless you took charges. Mm -hmm. And she was are, the, she do was the doctor, would he, would he keep records of that? I suspect he would. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and once again, let's use the lawyer's own words. We object to the use of the term cover-up as no such plan or plot ever took place to hide or assist in the alleged rape. As part from when WWE released you know, a statement saying that Ashley had not told anyone, and this is the first they're hearing of it, which is patently untrue. Back in 2022, this is a few years after Ashley uh, passed away, Paul London said the following, I do remember specifically many times when she would be crying to me because Vince McMahon was propositioning her to fly on the jet with them, London said. Kevin Dunn would be telling her that she has to fly on the jet with them. Every now and then, they'd always put the divas up at, like, the TV hotel or whatever. He'd be knocking on the her door and trying to get her to answer. So she Who would be knocking on the door? I, Ke I, Kevin I, Dunn? I don't. It doesn't make it no, clear whether Ke it's Vince. I, I think it's Vince. Or maybe Kevin yeah, Dunn, who knows? Well, maybe you, both. Well, well you, you brought up the name Kevin Dunn. Hmm. Funny, when did he leave? Right before all this broke? The end, yeah. Just uh, December 31st, in fact, exactly. Well, he, he knew it was coming too. So he got out of Dodge before the gunfight. Mm -hmm. But I don't think he's going to escape it either. I think they're going to call him. They're going to talk to him and... What did I say? You don't quit the business. The business has to quit you. So he tried to quit. And they came pulling him back in. Now, this is the weirdest part. The sworn affidavit was in response to Constantine Kairos, who uh, has sanctions imposed upon him still for litigation misconduct after attempting to sue WWE numerous times. And the most famous one was the concussion lawsuit with 60 former WWE performers named in that lawsuit that eventually went nowhere. Then almost a year after Ashley's sworn affidavit was signed, WWE claimed 
that Ashley had apologised to WWE, the company, and said that her case had been poached by Kairos and the legal battle had got out of control fast. Quote, Kairos refuted WWE's claim that Mazzaro emailed WWE, saying, She was being represented by me, he said. She never withdrew from the case. She never stopped being my client, and her case is currently pending. It's not a credible statement that she sent an email refuting the case. What a strange... Who did that? Who did it? Ashley Mazzaro Ashley. is apparently, a year before she died, a year after releasing the affidavit, has, has claimed by WWE that she wrote to them and apologised. And then the lawyer says that never happened. Somebody is not telling the truth here. No. I wonder who that could be. <laughs> now, Ashley Mazzaro died reportedly uh, reported by TMZ by her own hand, May 26, 2019, at the age of 39. So, but what she died? Suicide. Yeah, but what she do? Don't what, know. what was it? Don't know. I hate that. I didn't know that girl, but I've heard a lot of. Uh, People talk about her, very likable young lady. And, but I think that's what they look for. They look at somebody who has a kind of a shy, bashful background and they work on them because they can control them easier. We're going to move on. It's like you go, you, you're you going to fight somebody. You don't fight the biggest guy. You pick out, well, a guy that you think you can beat the crap out of. So, I mean, I've never done this. I was always the guy who's got the crap beat out of me. So, <laughs> We're going to move on. We've still got a ton of news. We're going to get through as much as possible, I promise you. And this might be an extended one. I might have to pay you more Dutch to get through it, I'll tell you. But uh, we will carry on. He's ready. Vince, it's not Vince ready. I'll call you right back, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing a podcast about you. Hey, thank you, man. See you. Yeah, thank you for the just, content. Yeah, I was yeah, I was just thinking it to this hit at a good time, so we got something to talk about. But next one, you brought this and it's to a my... lot. It's a lot better than just talking about wrestling. Oh, we can talk. I love talking about the news. I love talking about the. news. Oh yeah, that's more. great. That's great. It's just, it, it, weirdly, it makes my life easier because there's so much news out there that we can just do two hours of news, and that's the entire show. Um, <clears throat> you brought this to my attention. <laughs> this next piece of news: Gypsy Rose Blanchard backstage at WWE Dynamite. So, uh, what this this woman dynamite this was AEW, AE, yeah, AEW dynamite. So this hasn't made UK news at all. So tell us what you know about her. Well, Ripsy, uh, Gypsy Rose Blanchard, I think her name mm -hmm. is, and she is the the young girl that she had Munchausen syndrome by proxy. By, by proxy, which actually means the mother is always claiming that the child has an illness or can't walk or can't do this or can't do that. But it's for the purpose of having other people give you money and attention. or to yeah. gather sympathy or to do a lot of things. And they kept this girl like this and they did a whole, uh, uh, not a pay-per-view on it, but a documentary on it. And it finally ended up that the girl was about 16 or 15 or 16, got a boyfriend, talked the boyfriend into killing her mother. And she went to prison for 10 years. She's out now after eight. And the boyfriend got life imprisonment. But for AEW to book her on the show, now what have we got on these shows? I, I don't think she's we actually got, on the show. She was just backstage. But uh, someone invited to uh, someone invited to the. Well, to I the saw show. a picture of her. Yeah, she wasn't on stage, yeah. was she? Or was she? I saw a picture of her. I don't know if she was on the show, but she was invited. I didn't see the show. No, I've not. Um, no, I think it was backstage only. She wasn't actually on the show itself. Okay, um, but anyway, she she got invited to the show. So I like the idea that Tony Khan has gone, well, you know, Vince McMahon, you know, accused of all these things. Well, we're going to get a murderer on, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll top that, by golly. <laughs> so, yeah, you... you, you hey, that's not, hey, that's not funny. It's true. 
Now take take the laugh back. It's not funny. You got to treat this no, no, seriously. It's, it's, it is serious stuff, true. really. So apparently, Gypsy met this fella on ChristianDatingForFree.com, and then talked yeah. him into killing her mother. Which, in fairness, she was an awful woman. But uh, he ends up getting life. She yep. ended because of the mitigating circumstances. She gets ten years, of which she served about eight. Uh, the the thing I find funny is that they're happy to have Gypsy Rose Blanchard, who is you know got convicted of murder too for you know conspiracy and in the eyes of the law she's as guilty as the the, the boyfriend who stabbed her. Okay, they they will they will have a murderer or an accomplice not on the show but in the backstage, but yet they won't use Tessa Blanchard. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if they're related. He, he, well, he may have it out for anybody with the last name Blanchard. So, if any independent wrestlers out there named Blanchard, don't 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 call Ada AEW because they won't book you. Yeah, but if you if, if you're what, a convicted what, murderer, then you're fine. But they didn't book Tessa because of allegedly saying a few things backstage. Right? Difficult to work with, and apparently she once said something racist. Yeah, that's what I heard too. Yeah. But murder's okay. Yeah, murder's fine. That's fine. I mean, especially when you, you're you well-known. Tessa is not as well-known as this girl. Mm. So, But she was backstage, so how long is it going to take for her to hit the screen? Hmm. Hmm. We will see. Food for thought. Food for thought. Yeah, Gypsy Rose Blanchard is all elite. Look out for that. Look out for the signing. You know, she signed a contract <laughs> with him. Right. And then she's, she's in Japan. Hey. <laughs> she's been sent to New Japan. Yeah, let me. Uh, who was that guy from Stardom that got fired? He's called like something Rossi. Um, apparently, who is he? I never heard of him. It's. I don't know enough about it. Is it Stardom all female or no? Yeah, Stardom's all female. It's owned by Bushy Road. That's the same owners as New Japan. Apparently, the guy who I think he was the guy who used to own Stardom, then he sold Stardom to Bushy Road. Then he remained as the booker, and then they had creative differences. And then Rossi was also telling some of the women that he was going to start up his own promotion and basically trying to poach talent. So that's why he ended up getting fired, supposedly. Mm-hmm. Okay. I was going to say I didn't know anything about it, but I think I covered it quite succinctly there. You knew more about it than I did. Well, there you go. That's what happened. Right, let's get to the other giant news that's happened this week. The Rock has returned and is replacing Cody Rhodes at WrestleMania 40. We now, this, sort of needs, this needs some introspection. we got to look deep into this. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm sure that Vince, let's go back as far as Vince. He saw there was more money in The Rock than Cody. But yet it didn't go this far. It didn't. And But my question is this. They had to know this two months ago, or at least six weeks ago. Why would they, but they didn't know the Vince stuff? But why would they go ahead and still put Cody over in the Royal Rumble knowing or with knowledge of that The Rock is going to replace him without explanation yet? Let me say that yet. Well, you saw That's, SmackDown last week and yes, Cody came out and confronted Roman Reigns. So tell us what happened in the lead up to The Rock coming out. Well... They had Roman in the ring, and Cody came out, got in the ring, and they were talking back and forth. And But it ends up with Cody saying, do I need to take the belt from you or some other thing I didn't understand, or do I need to take your whole world or something like that? And then all of a sudden, the Rock's music hit. And here comes Rock. Of course, it shocks fans. You know, they they come alive. Because here comes Rock. I mean, he is cut up, brother, brother, brother. brother. He's cut up. He looks like he just walked straight out of the gym. Oh, deltoids out there and those triceps. And, you know, he walks in the ring and 
and they inform Roman reigns when they inform everybody else that Cody's not going to be facing him at WrestleMania. The Rock is. And then they whispered, they hugged Rock and Cody, and Rock was saying something in his ear. Get out of the ring now. Yeah, damn it. And he left the ring, and he left the ring in such a way you really felt sorry for Cody. Now it looks like Cody is the throwaway beer can. You know, there's no use for it now. I mean, he didn't have any energy. He didn't look like his heart was in it. And now I know, I know that WWE, they was that they they were in some unknown territory. Uh, CM Punk is hurt, and this thing with Vince happens. Brock Lesnar's gone, and yeah, he's brought into it. And Rock was appointed to the WWE advisory board. <laughs> is that what he's on? He's on the TKO board, so he's an executive. Well, he's yeah. on the board, and they take it away from Cody. Now, to me. I don't think it's that bad, but I'm not a, I'm not a fan per se. But the fans hated that. They say we followed this story and even when Cody was hurt, we followed the story. He's talking about Dusty and finished the story and because I thought that was great because Dusty had to endure and persevere through all these things that bad things that happened to him while he's chasing the title. Now, Cody is kind of retracing the same steps, but at the end, before he can finish the story, they yank it from him. It looks like to most of the fans. And I think Cody rock could be a heel before this is over. I hope not. But, and, but Cody is going to, I, I think we we haven't heard the end of the story and why did they do it? Because it's always been Royal Rumble, the winner faces the champion at WrestleMania. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's what he, he wanted. People were happy. Because I remember them when uh, Sami Zayn faced Roman in Quebec. Uh, the whole... They said the crowd was just electric when Sammy went out there. And, of course, you had, you know, Dave Meltzer and all those guys said, what a great thing it would be if Sammy would won. Well, he didn't win. And Quebec is not, you know, base your, you know, base your business off Quebec only. But they had built it around Roman Reigns for three years up to that point. So I don't know what they're going to do, but I will watch SmackDown just to see what they do and how they handle this. You said I'm sure it's going to, it's going to sell out anyway. You said beforehand that it's going to be The Rock and Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 40. We don't know that yet because The Rock only stared at Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes has not declared exactly who he's going to face yet. So it's still up in the air at the moment. But wouldn't it be funny if it was Roman Reigns and The Rock, and after three years of, of Roman Reigns holding the title, it turns out to be a 50-odd-year-old, you know, very much part-timer who ends up rest, wrestling the belt from him? Well, they spent a lot of time on this particular situation. And that's a a hard way to get into... A, a, a big pay-per-view, the biggest of the year, it's, it's a lot of going around to come back to the same spot. You see what I mean? Yeah. And I don't know. And I do, I do think it would be Roman, but I think they should have done something where Cody got hurt and he can't face him. To me, now we have a reason. So, and Cody, all he's got to say then is, when I get better, I'm going to go against whoever wins that match. If it's The Rock, then it's The Rock. If it's 
the same the same champion I've been going against, Roman, it'll be him. But he just walked away looking like a really sympathetic figure. I, I'm I'm saying this as I put myself in fan mode for about two minutes. So I want to see it through their eyes because the fans are the one are the last arbiters of whether this is going to work or not. And they may, if, if Roman does face him, it's according to the way this backlash is continuing. And I think even as we talk right now, aren't they doing a press conference they are actually in Las Vegas, yeah. So in Las what time Vegas. is it now for you? Half twelve almost. So I don't know when yeah. the I don't know when the press conference starts. Uh, what's it what's it when is WrestleMania? Uh first weekend in April, so I don't know. I think it's like sixth or seventh of April. What's the pay per view coming up now? Perth, Australia Elimination Chamber. Oh, okay, yes, that's right. That's right. But they're doing a and we may be doing another emergency podcast a little bit later, depending on how this uh, newscast, this press conference turns out. And uh, a, a bit of news very briefly. We'll get back onto The Rock in a second. Uh, Steve Mongo McMichael has been elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Good. He deserves it. We, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, just throwing that in there. Um, right. The Rock is... It just feels like if he's in the same match as Roman or Cody or whatever, or if he's just only in with one or the other or Roman, that he's going to be the one getting booed because now the perception of the fans is that he's now used his influence, he's used his new power to bully Cody out. It's given Cody and, the, the Daniel and, Bryan yeah. sympathy. But this is The Rock. He wants he wants his image to be squeaky clean, super popular, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, does he now, care? I heard, I heard, this is just rumor, okay. that Cody says, you may want to rethink this a little bit. He he can't disagree with replacing him in the match. I think what he was trying to say was, give me a reason that I think Rock is better than me right now because I'm hurt. And there's no way I could go against Roman, because I know I, I won't last. I think if he was hurt, people would understand it. And then The Rock says, it, I, I think the people's perception of this is Rock bullied his way into it, not only pushing Cody aside, but bullied the TKO board that he needs to take it. And, you know, you can look at it any way you want to, but... That's what you're eventually going to arrive back at. I think the TKO board would be on board because they see The Rock and they know who The Rock is. People are far less familiar with Cody Rhodes, even though the wrestling fan base believe that Cody Rhodes should be in the main event. But, you know, for the outside oh, of the think... man on the street, they want you know they think The Rock will be the better choice. They'll bring in more sponsorship. They'll get more eyes on the prize. They'll get more eyes on the pay-per-view. It makes sense financially, at least. Well, yeah, but don't forget that fan base. That's why those sponsors are there. They see that fan base. They see those big houses. And everybody, everybody knows WWE. Everybody, even wrestling fans who have never watched the match, they know who WWE is. And they know who Vince McMahon is. And they know, even in your subconscious, you still know who these people are. You know, say tennis players. I don't know tennis players because I'm not a tennis player. I don't, I don't play tennis. And some of these soccer players, I don't know that. But everybody, it's a part of the culture. Pro wrestling has always been a part of American culture. But you just said it's you, always you don't follow been tennis, there. you don't follow tennis, you nope. don't follow football, but you nope. know who Lionel Messi is, you know who Cristiano Ronaldo is, you know who David the Beckham major, is. The major stars. Exactly. And you, and people who but don't follow I, wrestling know who The Rock is. Right, they do. They know that. So that's what they're basing it on. I think they will bring more people in with The Rock there. And they still got time to give a reason or why Cody stepped out. And it's got to be a reason that makes sense because the people right now 
are like digging for what happened or what can they come up with? That's what I'm digging for. So I don't know. Okay, I want you um, to tell me this. We're going to get into a conspiracy in a minute. I know you love a conspiracy. But before we do, WrestleMania 40, there's two nights. So you've got The Rock, Roman Reigns, Cody Rhodes. You have Seth Rollins, but you also have Drew McIntyre, who is consistently involved with the Seth Rollins Raw World Championship as well. You've got five people there who you could all argue deserves a title shot. So, obviously, Roman Reigns is one champion. Seth Rollins is the Raw champion. You've got five people to deal with there. Does Drew McIntyre get a look in of either of the main events? And similarly, how would you deal with Cody Rock Roman? Well, at this point, judging from last week's SmackDown, I would still go with The Rock and Roman. It's a one-of-a-kind match. It will never happen again because The Rock is hitting 50. He's an actor. And you can tell he's working out like a bastard because he's all cut up. He looks like a Brahma bull. He looks great. Uh, and I think Cody, the way it is now, he's going up against uh, Drew because Drew attacked him mm -hmm. on Raw for no reason, just being a heel. And... Uh, Who's going against Seth Rollins? Well, that's why I'm asking you. Who who would you put against him? That's a good question. So I don't I, know. Who, I, I, gonna, I don't know who they would put him against. I'll I'll advise. I'll advance this. And WrestleMania 10 had a three man tournament. So essentially, you know, the, the, the Yoko Zuna had to wrestle both Brett and Lex in the same night. WrestleMania 20 had a triple threat match: Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Chris Benoit. WrestleMania 30 that you were at that show, that was the Daniel Bryan one where he advanced beating, I think, Triple H at the beginning, and then he beats Batista and Randy Orton in a triple threat match in the main event. So there's always like these triple threats, three-man tournaments going every 10 years at WrestleMania. The other thing is, I thought it was funny, is that 10 years ago, Batista comes back. Nobody wants Batista to be in the main event of WrestleMania, apart from Vince McMahon and but, a few higher-ups. And, and Batista... Yeah, and Batista himself. And, you know, they all <laughs> thought it'd be great, but the fans said, no, we want Daniel Bryan. And this strikes me as exactly the same situation. The Rock has come back. He thinks it's a great idea. The board think it, thinks it's a great idea, but the fans, thats he's not the fans' choice. Not this year. It's Cody. It's, the, it's mm -hmm. mirroring that situation almost well, beat for beat. Well, story, this story here, I think they went a roundabout way to get there. And I think The Rock is locked in. Uh, but they still need to explain how they arrived here. Somebody, uh, either Cody needs to get hurt or something. or And if they advertise Rock, they got to they gotta give, it, give it to him. They have to give it to him. And, but the story is not finished. So if we keep that in mind, and I did like what uh, Triple H said at one of those press conferences, a scrum is what they call it now. I hate that word, a scrum. You love it. Oh, I kind of do like it. But, <laughs> but he says the story never ends. That's exactly the way I booked Puerto Rico. The story never ends. And see, wrestling is the only only – sport you want to call it a sport that doesn't have an off season see off seasons come when business is down mm. <laughs> they just went through about a year or two of in wwe of an off season that's when nobody much coming to the matches and the and the ratings are down that's your off season football has an off season basketball baseball and soccer they all have an off season wrestling doesn't have off seasons it's a TV show. It's an entertain, uh, entertainment medium, and there's nothing like it in the world. So it remains to be seen. I don't have a theory yet on wh where this is going. Possibly I will come up with something in the next week or two. Now you like but see, I don't, I don't sit down and just say, hmm, I wonder what, and just keep thinking about it. You know, I'm doing something and something will pop up in my head and 
and then I put it away and I finish what I'm doing and or when I'm riding somewhere, going somewhere, driving or whatever, I know the, a pop in my head. But sometimes it just pops in my head out of nowhere. And that's how some of my greatest ideas have occurred to me. And I think a lot of bookers will tell you that. They were thinking about something else and bam, it's there. And the more they think about it, and it could be brilliant. Who knows? Now, you like a conspiracy theory. We no, know that. So we've got one here, wrestling one. So this is from Wrestling Inc. They've sort of done a timeline of the whole Rock Cody Rhodes thing. Now, Wait some... a minute, Wrestling Inc., are they wrestlers? No. They don't know. No. Okay, go no. ahead. They, they, they've they've um, compiled news stories, essentially, from everywhere. So some sources told Fightful that the decision goes all the way up to Ari Emanuel and Mark Shapiro and was even above Nick Khan and Triple H. This is with The Rock coming to WrestleMania. A claim that corroborates PWI's reports that TKO executives backed the decision to go with Dwayne Johnson over Cody Rhodes. Then February 3rd, PWI report contains numerous details about how the power structure in WWE may have changed as a result of the deal with Johnson, who had a recent history of attempted corporate power plays. So this is the quote, with Johnson's power as a member of the TKO board of directors, his Hollywood standing and the backing of Ari Emanuel, Nick Khan and others, the decision was made to go with Rock vs. Reigns as the headline bouts, believing it would be a greater attraction for the mainstream and also help push some positive momentum for the company. One source compared it to Johnson's attempt to take over the overall creative for the DC film franchise. So that was the whole Black Adam thing and that didn't work out and then etc. PWI went on to compare the DC power struggle, which Johnson ultimately lost, to a potential power struggle in WWE, which he would be in much better position to win. This was a strategic move to give Johnson more political power overall and to show Endeavour's faith in his involvement, the report said. Even Paul Levesque, who has done an admirable job as chief creative officer, would lose that power struggle with Johnson at this point, as one source surmised. This certainly isn't hurting ratings, as Raw did basically the identical week before, you know, the whole Rock thing coming in. But this is alleging that all of this is a power play from The Rock to almost be above Triple H and insert his own creative and basically have oh. a creative hand in WWE going forward. The, the way you explained it there, it is not a power play by Rock alone. It's a collaboration between Nick Khan and who's the other guy, Ma Manuel? Uh, Ari Emanuel, Mark Shapiro. Manuel and The Rock. So I think, and I have no doubt that The Rock is a, a huge name to have in your main event at a big show like WrestleMania. I got it. But the deal is not what you're doing right now is what you're going to do the week after WrestleMania? And where are you going with this? You may have a, I've seen a lot of sellouts and you come back the next week and you don't know how to follow it and your house falls in half. Uh, now that's when we were actually depending on raw attendance to get paid. But WWE has, they have contracts, they have sponsors. So it doesn't matter so much on the wrestler side because they're going to make the same amount of money anyway what their contract calls for. But The Rock, he got $3 million to be in on the TK board. 30. 30 million? Yeah. Damn. I, I thought it was 3 million. No, no, it's to be paid. 30 in, million? It's, it's to be paid in four installments. So he's already been paid the first installment of seven and a half million. Yeah. Wait a minute. What if they pay him the first installment? Then they don't pay him anymore. Well, he better not do anything <laughs> untoward he, he, on him. <laughs> uh, that's not even funny. I'm not even laughing at that. I'm not laughing at that. That is a really crude, crude comment you Yes, made. I'm sorry. But $30 million, and he'll probably make a million for WrestleMania. <laughs> what, a $1 million? And the rest, he'll make five, I bet. Or maybe this $30 maybe. Million includes one match at WrestleMania as well, so it's all... It's all rolled yeah, it could into be, one it could be payment now. Bundled, it could be bundled up. But it is an interesting story. One that's not finished. Like Cody's not the only one that wants to finish the story, his story. But I want to see how they finish this story. Yeah, but once once he finishes the story, then the story's finished. Then where do you go? You've got well, to start goes, another story. No, I think he'd go on to do what he's going to do and just serve on the board. Or be a, and just be a talking head on TV. 
Let me let me ask you this, Dutch. So this uh, from PWI, Mike Johnson, I'm presuming, but it just says PWI. Uh, it's sort of what does go ahead. Pro Wrestling Insider. Mm -hmm. It sort of comes across like this: is that the Rock is actually actively trying to usurp Triple H in a creative capacity? Do you think that could be the Rock's ultimate goal here? Is to be the chief content creative officer of WWE? Would he have enough time? No, I think The Rock, if he's going to do anything, I think he's going to call his own stuff. That's what he's going to do. I don't think he wants to get bogged down on the first match, second match, tag team, this, that, and the other. Rock wants to handle his own stuff, build his own opponents. That is, if he's going to continue after WrestleMania, which I don't, I don't, I don't see a, I don't see a path for that. I think he will. Oh, he may have a path for that for like a year, maybe. But then he's got a. It's like anything else. Things get old if you show it too much. And, and this is one of those stories that the wrestling fans are beating their brains out, wondering where it's going. That's where all the intrigue comes from. Hell, if I'm intrigued, you know the average fan is. And some and one of the fans I read the other day, I'll never go to another WWE event in my life. Until the next one. Yeah, to, if, yeah he'll, he'll be right in front of SmackDown next week. Because it's an – listen, I, I've written about this before. It is an addiction. You just don't drop this addiction overnight. I mean, you can't watch wrestling all your life. And all of a sudden, nope. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. Unless it's boring and you've seen AEW. I mean, their their ratings have just tanked and went down. And they're already plugging their London reappearance. Oh, yeah, but the tickets for that have actually sold quite well. But a couple of weeks ago for AEW, we're not talking about AEW, but AEW, two of their three shows a couple of weeks ago was beaten by Discovery's uh, Little Big Brawlers. Which is like a like a midget wrestling comedy documentary show. So Well, hey, I'm a big fan of that. Have you actually watched it? No. You need to review that next week, I'm telling you. Uh, just very briefly because you when, mentioned when are they on when are they on? I don't know. They're not in this country okay. as far as I know. I mean maybe they are, but Little don't... Little Bruisers. Yeah. No, little it's like little big brawlers, I think it's called. Anyway, okay. Anyway, the ratings for that beat Rampage and Collision a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, no, it didn't. It did. That's bad. Yeah. So, Cody himself as an impassioned plea to some of the more nut jobby uh, Twitter fans and social media users and that kind of thing actually had to write, "Appreciate the passion. God bless you all, but." Trust me. So the story will play out. It seems, at least in Cody's mind, that there's a plan well, going through. There were some death. There were some death threats that. issued, right? Yes, there was. That's exactly where I was going to it. The Rock's daughter gets death threats. With the Rock's return and apparent bullying of Cody Rhodes out of the uh, finishing of his story at WrestleMania 40 has brought out all the, you know, the incels and the nut jobs and the just generally unbalanced shut-ins in the wrestling community to come together and send The Rock's daughter, Simone Garcia Johnson, who currently is the NXT GM under the name Ava, death threats. Now, wait a minute. Now, that is kind of suspicious now, too. That, She's the head of a NXT. Weird, isn't it? Yeah. Now it's getting deeper. She's the head of NXT. Rock is at the head of uh, WWE on the board, main event, WrestleMania. Wait a minute. I haven't really thought about this. But that adds a different deal, a deal to wrestling fans that the um, Ari Emanuel and Nick Khan are gonna find out that this wrestling fan base is kind of nuts. Because when you start getting death threats on a wrestling show, you're you're touching some hearts and minds somewhere. And in, in, in a bad way. So let's hope it doesn't go that far. Well, apparently uh, Ava received death threats to the point that she has deactivated all of her social media accounts. Are we at peak sadness of humanity that people are so butthurt over fucking wrestling that they wish death upon The Rock's daughter? Yeah, that's not right. Now, it's interesting to me, but I damn sure ain't going to 
think about hurting someone or even talking sharply to them. It, it is it is what it is. And I'm they actually made me a wrestling fan over again. Now I want to see, now I want to see the rest of the story. Tell me. And I keep bringing up uh, Puerto Rico. That's the way I booked because the story never ended and it, it just kept going. I just added new people in and took people out. Now, excuse I'm watching, me. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting. Send uh, this quick death threat. Sorry, continue. <laughs> I'm watching a, I guess it's a series. It's called Chicago Med. And it's uh, continuing, you know, it's episodic s series. But they do an angle on that show about every five minutes. But they don't let you get bored. And it's all inside of a hospital and it's in Chicago with all the gunshots and this, that, and the other and all the in interweaving stories. Yeah, my missus the loves that show. She loves it. She binge watched it last. Does week. she? Yeah, she. Loves oh, it. I I'm I'm binge watching it now. I I can't help it. I'm addicted. And then he gets to the last episode. And I say, I can't wait. Wait a minute. This is the last one. Damn it. Yeah, but you're not sending them death threats when you know, like, whoever, I don't know, they write in a script that someone has a heart attack and drops. And it's mm, the, it's crazy. The same, it's the, but it's the same thing. Okay, let's talk about this. Who is the number one merchandise seller? Cody? Um, uh, I can't remember the list. I can't find the list. Cody was very high. Austin may have been second. No, but but now it's Cody? I, th I, th I can't remember. I think it probably was Cody Rhodes. We did this list like two, three months ago. I can't remember. But yeah, I think Cody was, if not top, second. Well, who would be top? Steve Austin. Still? I think I think it was Cody Rhodes first and then Steve Austin second, yeah. Wow. You would think after all this time he's been gone and his sales would be certainly not at number two. Hmm. Well, that surprises me. Well, they still own the Stone Cold name, so I figured that they push his uh, merchandise quite hard still because the I mean they'll have to give Steve Austin a cut but I think WWE still probably own the Steve Austin uh, sorry the uh, Stone Cold name mm -hmm. shall we okay shall we get to our final bit of news we've skipped so much as well and I mean you should have seen the size of the script I, I say war and peace and all that kind of thing but God, they, just, they get bigger every week Scott Demore fired from TNA now Hey, I don't have a lot of great love for TNA, but I did work there for nine years, and and I like Scott. And he took it when it went to when they changed Impact. What's the name of their show now? It's TNA. Uh, was again. The, the show's Impact still, but the company's TNA again. Okay, and Axis took it, mm -hmm. and they got. Uh, all of a sudden, TNA or Impact is showing signs of coming back. And I kind of like their show. <clears throat> it's pretty good. Uh, but all of a sudden, they come off a good pay-per-view and they let Scott Demore go. And I'm going, wait a minute. He's the guy who stayed or that you didn't fire and wanted him to help you. And he kind of straightened out your program and got you back up viable to compete. Then they, they, they can him. I, I don't, I don't get that at all. Do you get it? Well, let me give you the full, it's not the full, but the, the, a bit of the bump that they, Release. So obviously Scott DeMaul, who's been working on and off, but mostly on for TNA, had been with the company for around 17 years. Since mm -hmm. 2003, he has been removed as TNA president. So Anthem, and, uh, Anthem Sports and Entertainment Inc., a global multi-platform media company, announced today the appointment of Anthony Ciccioni 
as the president of TNA Wrestling. He already worked for Axis, uh, I believe. So that's the channel name, isn't it? Axis? Axis. Yeah. The move aims to further integrate but TNA I've, Wrestling. I've never, but I've never seen it. Which well, it's, it's a fairly minor cable station, as, as best I know. So yeah, and it, must be high up in the numbers. Uh, the move aims to further integrate TNA Wrestling with Anthem's entertainment group, of which Ciccioni is the president. Leveraging the entire company's resources to add more value in areas including production, blah, 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 blah. So that kind of, you know, business speak kind of thing. But essentially, uh, Ciccioni, uh, what did he say? Uh, anyway, he already worked for Axis or Anthem or whoever it was. So there was an internal Zoom meeting with the new TNA president, which reportedly didn't go down very well because, one, Demore is well-liked, and his tenure with the company and the, uh, is very, very long, and the talents were not allowed to ask uh, Anthony Ciccioni any questions so it's a pre-prepared statement and then goodbye and at the point during uh, the call uh, it was referenced that Demore had stepped down which wasn't the case he was fired he was fired mm -hmm. from the president uh, so he was removed from president uh, TNA president and then fired well for his, for his supporters in the company that's just a straight out lie because if, if he does step down you know he would have been making statements backstage or to one of his friends or that, you know, I can't do it anymore and I'm going, I'm going to leave. No, he was, he was summarily, I guess that's the word gotten fired, gotten rid of, but I kind of worry about that company now because I wor I worked there for, for nine years and it was kind of, in shambles then they may have put it back together and this guy Sissioni, i guess i'm that's the name i give him yeah, Sissioni. Uh, it's Ciccioni, i think it is oh uh, anyway mr c <laughs> i don't think mr c knows anything about pro wrestling and to be in that position you need to know something he doesn't know anything and I think it's this is not going to go well for TNA, and and then that's a company that's had a uh, a system of making mistake after mistake after mistake. But at one time, and I'll tell you in a minute why I think what happened. I, I heard from the inside scoop. Hey, I had a scoop. Mm -hmm. uh, I th I think when I was I was there in two thousand seventeen. And I didn't much like it, but I had heard then that I thought that Scott Damore had bought into the company. So he may have had some interest in the ownership. And I don't know if he still has ownership or not, even if he did then. I just, I just heard that. But the reason I think that he was let go or released I don't like to use the word fire because that has a an aura of like uh, they were mad at him. I don't think they're mad at him. They just they couldn't agree with him. I think it was a budget. I think he wanted to bring in some big names, but those big names requirements, as in salary uh, request, were just too too. TNA was outrageous. I think he wanted to bring in CM Punk at one time, and he kept he kept trying to get CM Punk. I heard, and then what's that girl's name? The uh, Mercedes Monet. Yes, Mercedes Monet, and hers was higher than that. So what that is telling me is they would come in, but they didn't really want to. But if you're going to pay them this amount of money, they couldn't afford not to come. So, and they were telling, I think, Scott, yeah, we'd love to be there. And so he got all the the sugar and honey from them. And, but when he presented a, a salary demand to, to TNA, they go, oh, our, our impact. He said, hey, there's no way we can do that. So I think there were some hurt feelings over that or some shattered relations over that. And I, I think that's why that's what happened. So I, that's another conspiracy. That's another theory of mine. But but I talked to Scott. Uh, 
I think, via text. And he seemed very happy. And I congratulated on the show. I watch the show every now and then or catch bits and piece, pieces of it off off social media. So it looked pretty good to me. Yeah, the pay-per-views were doing better as well. I think they bumped it up to like um, 30,000 buys or something, which doesn't sound, you know, huge in the grand scheme of things with yeah, but, everything. But, I mean, but TNA, what pay, is the, TNA pay-per-views are doing as low as 2,000 at one point in like the 2010s or early 2020s. You know what their biggest one was? I know which one it was. We've uh, Which one was it? Samoa Joe and Kurt Angle. It sure was. Oh, yeah. I got a lot of heat off of it. <laughs> what, what, you mean internally or you mean story? No, internally. No, not storyline. I wasn't in the story. No, it I'm, was inter- I mean, internally in the office. Oh, in why? the office. Because I had Joe do this interview one time. And this is a, this is a rule in wrestling. They won't come to see the heel win. But they will come if they think there's a chance that the baby face will win. So I had Joe do an interview one time and says if he did not beat, this was his last one, if he didn't beat Kurt Angle at whatever the name of the pay-per-view was, that he would quit wrestling. That he'd, he'd given him a timeline himself, self-imposed, that he'd give himself three years to win the title, and the three years would be up around this match with Kurt Angle. And if he didn't win, he would just he'd just remove himself from wrestling. Oh, they heard that and they went nuts. Why did you tell him to say that? I said, well, wait a minute. Isn't he winning? Well, yeah, but he's winning. But why, why did you say that? I says, well, because he'll, he'll keep a promise. He will say, I'm go- if I don't quit, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. Now the people really want him to win. And when he wins, that he predicted he would win. Now he's over more with them. Even Dixie Carter called me in there, and she went, "Now Dutch, uh, where did that come from?" I said, "Well," and I told her the same logic I had. I said, "I didn't tell him something that's not going to happen. It is going to happen." And the people said, "Well, what if he don't win while he's gone?" Now that's what the people are thinking. But I says, "He is winning, isn't he?" Well, yeah, he's winning. I said, I don't see the deal. I don't see it. She said, well, it'll hurt sales. I said, I think it'll help sales. I said, we have a, let's agree to disagree. You're the boss, but it's already done. Well, let's see what it does. You know how many buys it did? I don't know. Was it like 80 or something or 80,000? Something Something 70 or 80. A lot better than 30 and a lot better than two. Did 80,000 buys, the biggest buy rate that they've ever done. And I'm not saying because of what I had Joe say, got it there, but it damn sure didn't hurt it. That's for dang sure. Well, you've, you've said this before, and it's like, you know what? When uh, Here's a perfect example, uh, a couple of different ones. Hogan Andre, right? Rest, uh, it wasn't WrestleMania, it was the Saturday night main event where mm-hmm. 33 million people watched and whatever. They were reporting in the newspapers, Andre's winning the title on this show this Saturday. And people must have been so upset at the time, thinking, how could you give away the result? More people tuned in. Yes. Sometimes, if you promise something really important that the fans want to see, they will tune in in droves. We will see it happening. Well, we did it that night, and they had a great match. Hey, Joe and Angle could turn it on. They had some great, great stuff. And I was even watching the match. I said, damn, this is good. This is really good because they got them up. They had the people's attention. But you can have their attention, but you've got to hold that attention through this hour, through this match. you got to hold it. They held it. And as soon as Angle lost, like a pro, he vacated the scene so he wouldn't be a distraction and left Joe the ring. And I think that's when all the people got in the ring. Uh, maybe not. But anyway, he, he was over. He was he was over that night. There we go. Some more Booking 101 from the master booker, Dutch Mantel. Listen, we're going to shut down this podcast now. It's been a bit of a long one, quite frankly. Thank you very How much, everybody. How long is it? 
uh, it's getting towards two and a half hours. This has just gone on and on. I cut out stuff out of the script for this one as well, but uh, we, we, we we got more stuff to talk about next week. I suppose so. We've, there's always yeah. more stuff to talk about, but I really need a wee as well, so I'm going to shut this down quickly. Pro Wrestling Tees, questions for Dutch at gmail.com to submit your questions for the Tuesday show. Dutch has got a doll there. He's got hats there. If you're interested in maybe auctioning or getting a signed hat from the Dutchman himself, go to or email Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. Same for the diplomas, same for the signed books. And Shane Douglas' official YouTube channel, Franchise University, with Shane Douglas out every single Wednesday. Clips on every single day on the YouTube channel. That's it for now. Thank you very much for watching. Oh, and the big hook for Ask Dutch Anything this coming Tuesday is that Dutch Mantel will be trying... I'm going to open it. No, 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 no. Do it. Do it for the next episode. Do it for the next episode. Do it for the next episode. If you want to see Dutch open and taste the can, it will be this coming Tuesday, Ask Dutch Anything. But for now... Woo! We the people. I messed it up. Woo! <laughs> <laughs>